Welcome to the meeting of the Milpitas Unified School District Board of Education. We appreciate your attendance and participation in our education proceedings, which align with the guidelines set forth by the Ralph M. Brown Act for Openings. Tune in to our hybrid style board meetings online or either Zoom or YouTube or in person inside our boardroom. Public comments can be made while you are logged on to Zoom or if you're in person, YouTube, however, is a listen only option. If you're unable to do either of these, please visit our written public comments webpage for instructions on how to submit your written comment. One public comment per person, one public comment per person is allowed for each item. Today's meeting will open with a study session. Roll call. Board President Chris Norwood here. Board Vice President Min Nil. Here. Board Clerk Kelly Chuan. Here. Board Member Anunaka. Here. Awesome. Our student board reps will join us later. Is there a motion to review and approve the study session agenda? Move to approve. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none, motion carries. Are there any public, any, are there any comments from the public at this time? Uh, we have no public comments at this time. We have no public comments at this time, so let us proceed with the study session, uh, learning and development. All right, thank you. We'll just wait for uh, Scott to pull up our slides. Thank you. Um, so I want to just start by introducing myself and, and the team that is presenting today. Um, I'm Preeti Jahari, the Executive Director of Learning and Innovation. I will be presenting with these three teammates and give them a, uh, a moment to introduce themselves. Uh, but I also just want to frame that this is work uh, that the four of us are presenting on, but is work that is being done by many, many people in our district, uh, including our principal, Carissa Scott, who's here. And I know there's a couple of other principals um, and teacher leaders uh, that are working to join us online. So um, again, it's collective work that we are sharing with you today. And I'd also like to mention as we get started that um, study sessions for board members are just that, study sessions. So we're curious, uh, we're trying to get better understanding uh, in the context of everything that we do as board districts in support of the district operations. And so I just want to make sure that as we ask questions, you understand that it's about curiosity, not critical in terms of your work because you are the experts in these areas and we are learning so that we can best support the direction of the district. Good evening or good afternoon. Um, I am Marissa Coide, the director of secondary. My name is Richard Hart and I am a TOSA with the learning and development. <laughs> Teacher on special assignment. Okay, Excuse thank me. you. <laughs> she, she knows right away. We got <laughs> good evening, my name is Raquel Kusunoki, director of elementary education. And I think Raquel and Richard started out together as teachers in this district. Yes. So, okay. And I, and I appreciate that framing for today as well. We can move to the next slide. Um, this is this is our opportunity to share with you like what we are really excited about and would love for you to approach this work with curiosity and ask us questions. So. Deeper learning, what we're going to do today is break down some educational jargon for you, right? What does deeper learning mean? What are the features of deeper learning assessments? Um, I hope you will be able to leave today uh, being able to speak about those things and answer those questions when you get them from parents or you get them from teachers. Uh, but more importantly, I hope that you leave today understanding um, or sharing our takeaway that deeper learning is what good instruction looks like. And so we want to highlight those features um, and bring some consistency to how we as an L&D team are talking about about them and the structures that we're building behind that, but also how you as the board are talking about the work that we're doing here in MUSD. Um, we're also going to make some connections um, throughout our presentations from L&D, right? You hear us highlighting, naming to you, here are the equity gaps that we see in, in student outcomes. And so today we wanna make that connection with, okay, here are some of the gaps, here are some of the ways that we propose um, 
increasing our consistency and increasing um, the opportunities for students so that we actually can close some of the opportunity gap that exists currently in our district. Um, and then we want to talk, like, this isn't new work. This isn't something that just started with me joining the district or, or any of these members. This is work that has been existing and happening in our district. Um, but our role is to bring some more consistency uh, to that process. And so we want to share that timeline, um, highlight some projects that are happening, but also our timeline for how we will um, bring that consistency forth so that students are getting equitable experiences or deeper, meaningful learning experiences in their classrooms, right? And this connects back to uh, strategic goal number four, uh, how, to, how are we working to make sure that all of our students are engaged in their learning um, and making academic gains? Next slide. So with that spirit of curiosity and knowing that we like to make our deep, um, deeper learning sessions, our study sessions more interactive, I actually wanted to start with some questions. We're gonna, stare, um, we're gonna share some student perspectives, but I would love if two of our board members could share with us what, when you think about your K-12 educational experience, what is an assessment that still sticks with you, that you look back and say, you know what, that mattered and I learned this. So I'm gonna ask you to share what the assessment was and what the learning was for you. So do you have two volunteers? Chris is ready. He's looking around to see who else is. Oh, no. I could defer her. I could, I could clearly defer and just, and just ride their coattails on this one. I, I... How about our two youngest board members? <laughs> it's not a trick question. This is really meant to ask you, like, what has stuck with you, right? It's been a while since you were in K-12, um, right? No shade there, but it's true, right? Uh, so what has stuck with you? Now, the interesting thing is I don't remember the, the name of the assessment, but during my K-12 experience, it was taking Scantron tests and uh, those California assessments and um, not understanding the the outcome of the results, right, and how it shaped. Obviously, today uh, we see that it helps fuel some of the funding and some of the important ways to uh, focus on on the gaps uh, that are there. So you remember those, and what? How did they influence you as a student? Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. Well, the the interesting thing was it was a standardized test, right? And, and to that point, it was trying to set a level level playing field. Um, obviously, my parents are immigrants. Uh, English being a second language, um, you know, it, it, it provided a little bit more context of like not necessarily having to go deeper into the, the understanding, but just to, to assess the general knowledge. Okay, thank you. Anybody else? And you can use a standardized assessment, classroom assessment, anything. Okay, so um, I remember um, finals in high school. Uh, I remember it was a combination of seeing how much you could cram and remember um, from your learning, but then also how much you actually knew from the, the year and the ability to reflect through your notes and how well you were basically organized in those types of things in high school. And you, you were never really, I was never really organized enough or couldn't memorize enough because there was a lot of things going on during the high school time frame, and it's difficult for a student to be connected every day in the classroom for however many days it takes before that assessment or that exam comes up. So I remember that, and I'm really thoughtful of the days. So there's an alignment there when Wendy talks about attendance and how that affects our ADA. Mm -hmm. I know attendance also affects the ability for students to have access to the information, which is part of the challenges which some of our students have when they're not at school. All right, thank you so much. So I, thank you. Anybody else? I, I, I don't want to limit to just two if, two, if anybody else is excited to, to share anything. And if anybody wants to go specific on a, uh, a specific presentation or a final or something that you're like, that was still like a good one. Yeah, no, in high school, I remember every Friday we would have like a chapter test for our pre-cal class and I would try to cram everything in like the night before and, you know, stay up doing all-nighters and stuff like that and, um, yeah, I just hated it, you know. 
<laughs> All right, so themes that I'm hearing is some accountability, cramming, um, multiple choice or Scantron based tests. I'm not really sure how I came out on the other end of that. Um, and now let's hear from some of our students. Um, there's four videos here. Hopefully uh, you, you have access to all of them. We're gonna take time to, to listen to two today. So Scott, if you can start me off with um, Caleb right there with the San Jose sweatshirt. He's the bottom. Yep, there you go. Thank you. So they were asked the same question of what's an assessment that you remember and tell us why. Hi, my name is Caleb Rivero. I go to Joseph Weller Elementary. Uh, good morning, Caleb. I, I want to, uh, today I would like for you to talk about an engaging assignment or project you enjoyed doing either in fifth grade or sixth grade. In fifth grade, I did a project called Road Trip, and I really enjoyed it because I got to work with other people and got to see their personalities. Yeah. Could you explain that assignment a little bit? What so, did you have to do? Basically, I got to make, we got to make our own road trip. We got to decide whether or not we could go to the Midwest, Southeast, Northeast, and so on. And what, well, what did you, in that uh, project, what were, were you assigned specifically? Like, what were the details of that assignment? So, what did it involve? It involved basically working together and saying, hey, we should probably go to this place instead of this place because it might be cheaper instead of going over budget. Uh, so you were working with a budget? Yeah. Uh, okay. And what did you, so what's, what is the best part of that assignment? The best part of that assignment was probably you, you could leave the town and you could basically, you had four places to visit and you got to decide what to do in those places. So you were really, you really liked the decision, being able to make your own decision? Yes. Okay. So, uh, what learning stuff did you since completing that assignment? I've learned that I could use other ways of math to help me with projects. Okay, can you think of another way that you've used it? Uh, standard algorithm, uh, partial products. Oh, uh, to do what? To do, basically, I, for if it's a math project, any math standard, if it's a history project, research. Okay. Now, can you tell me uh, about any challenge you overcame during that project? Um, one challenge we overcame was not to argue with each other. If we argued with each other a lot, we would probably not finish the project. Okay. And uh, what uh, what helped you be successful? Um, basically, like I said before, if we don't not argue with each other, mm -hmm. and if, since we didn't argue with each other, we finished the project in time. Um, how did how did you solve those conflicts that you had? Basically, uh, we would look at, we would say, all right, so let's see, who has a, let's see what the pros and cons are. Oh, it's, okay. So you need some uh, some strategies for that. Yeah. Okay. And then um, if you were to talk to an educator or a teacher, what advice would you give them so that they could create assignments like this that are meaningful and fun? So one advice I would say is have each student at least ask one question, because if no students ask a question, then one student might be confused later on. Any any other advice you would give? Uh, no, that's all the advice I'll give. Okay. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. So a couple of things that I would like to highlight from Caleb, and remember, he's an elementary school student here, elementary. and the eloquence with which he's speaking, and if you want to know what makes my heart flutter when he says standard algorithm and partial product, right, like <laughs> precise academic language there. Um, but, the, but the things that he leads with are collaboration, authentic decision making, um, both with his peers, but also with like, what is he gonna, where are they gonna go here? So when we talk about real world problems, like you probably hear that a lot, um, or see that in newspapers, our education articles, um, what his assignment, what his assessment here did was real world in two ways, right? They were using math to solve a real world situation that might come up, and it was real world in terms of how he had to work with other kids. Right? That is what you and I, we have to do consistently um, in our jobs. So it was real world and preparatory for him in these two distinct ways. We're gonna highlight one more student voice here and that's the upper right co um, corner with Casey, a middle school student. School. Well, can you introduce yourself? 
at the, um, my name is Casey, and the school I went to last year was Spangler, and the school I'm currently going to is Russell Middle School. Could you explain a little bit about the Good Kind of Trouble project that you did last year? So the book that I read was about a girl who was protesting about Black Lives Matter. She wanted to raise awareness with her school and with her family. Okay. And what were you asked to do in the project? I was asked to create a wristband about a real world problem. Okay. And what problem did you choose? I chose to talk about drug abuse. Okay. And what and what did you learn? Um, what did you what did you enjoy about that project? I enjoy learning more about it because whenever I, like my parents talked about it, they always just told me never to take drugs, but they never really told me why and what the effects of it were. So I enjoy learning more about like why you shouldn't take them. Yeah. And what really stuck with you when you um, with this assignment? I like the um, the effects of it. It was like not the effects, but like. Whenever people tell me like to never take drugs or whenever the topic comes up, it always like sticks in my mind like why and what happens when you do, even if you only take it a few times. And then what challenges did you have to overcome to be successful in this project? I had to figure out how to use like the new app that I've never used before and like making a design that will uh, like that relates to the problem, that relates to the uh, assignment. Okay. And then what advice would you give educators so that they create assignments um, more like this uh, for learners? I uh, definitely make sure that people understand what the assignment is and that clearly, and state clearly what you have to do. And like, so to give clear instructions so no one gets like confused about what, um, like what topics they are and are allowed to do and not allowed to do and have it open to whatever topics they feel like doing. Um, so Richard wanted me to share that, that Casey is, is, well, he didn't want me to share this part, that Casey's a former student of his, but what he shared with our team, um, and Richard led all these interviews with students, was that the first day of school this school year, um, when Casey saw Richard, she like avoided him because that, I, that having to speak to a teacher that, um, just like having to engage in the conversations, she was very shy and that was hard for her, but look at where she is now right and she's allowing us to film her and do that so again when we talk about preparation that's part of it and um one of the things that casey highlights is um that while she's working on persuasive writing and research skills she's also learning a number of other things right she is practicing critical thinking she is practicing design thinking because she's designing this um, armband and has to go through multiple iterations she is learning how to use a new app Right? So again, when we talk about skills that we're going to all have to use regularly in our lives and how can our assessments embed both that content knowledge, but also some of these 21st century skills, that's what deeper learning assessments do. They blend them together. So on the next slide, and please do take time to, to go back and look at some of these videos. And we have more, so we will be populating the, the weekend reports that you get um, with some more student videos. They're about two minutes long, so hopefully you can, you can take the time to click into them. Um, I want to now use these set of images to, to talk about two different points. Um, one is to talk about equity by design, and then this other idea of we don't just push for growth, we plan for growth, right? Um, so the, the image on the far left, the black and white image, um, is a, a classroom picture from like 1920. Um, and there are classrooms that really haven't changed that much since then, right? Um, and, and those classrooms that were designed, our school system historically was not designed with equity in mind. It was actually designed to keep the status quo in place. Um, and so therefore, the way that classrooms function is really about discrete knowledge. Um, it is about memorization. It is procedural learning. Um, and those that are compliant are often the most equipped um, or best able to kind of navigate the system. 
right? Um, which leads me to kind of the second point of saying, and that's not what's going to be preparing our students for college, career, and life in our present day or in their future, right? 10 years from now, 20 years from now. Um, and what we wanna move through is then thinking about how do our classrooms consistently prepare students to be engaging, um, sorry, thinking about how assessments can actually be used to leverage change in instruction so that students are then continually engaging in what we're calling deeper learning, but learning that has them building knowledge. There, there's still facts, procedures, um, you know, foundational concepts that you have to understand. There's no way around that, right? You need to understand those, um, but you need to be able to then put those together in authentic situations um, and add in or layer in those 21st century skills. Um, I don't know if you saw over December in the New York Times, uh, there was an article about the GPT chatbot and it put forth um, essays that were written by real fourth grade students and then by this chatbot. Yeah, yeah. And teachers, educators, principals, and everyday people um, were asked to go through it and, and figure out which one was written by a student, which one wasn't. And I don't know about you, but I got a couple wrong, right? I was priding myself as being a former English teacher, I can do this. Uh, but when the chatbot was able to really infuse emotion into it, I was like, oh, you got me, right? Um, but the point is that we then need to change what we are asking our students to do in order to prepare them for what they are gonna be asked to do in college, career, and life, right? Because our machines, our, the other things around us are changing the skills. It's not about humans becoming obsolete, but we need to bring a different skill set to the table and we need to practice that regularly in our classroom. So the little image on the, the right is about like when we create these opportunities to build knowledge, produce authentic work and infuse 21st century skills, then the outcome for students is still mastery, right? It's not about fluff. They still do need to know the, the deep content, content and master that. But when they are working in it in a relevant context, um, adding their own decision making to it, we are also cultivating their identity and cultivating their creativity, right? And these are features of culturally responsive teaching. These are features of what we need to do specifically to engage our Latino and black students in the classroom. Next slide, I think I'm gonna, oh. Yeah, I think there's there's one more quote, sorry, uh, that I did really want to share. Uh, this is a quote from uh, a deeper learning article, and, and some of the, the key uh, thought leaders around this are Linda Darling-Hammond, um, Jal Mehta, um, Pedro Neguero. Um, so perhaps you've heard of some of these, uh, some of them are, are local celebrities in education. Um, but one of the quotes that really strikes me is that they talk about the shifts that we have been making in education, but that uh, students in more affluent schools and top, top tracks are often given the problem-solving education that befits the future managerial class. Whereas students in lower tracks um, or remedial courses and higher poverty schools are given the kind of rule-following tasks that mirror much of the factory and other working class work. Right? So when we talk about closing the opportunity gap, it is about making sure that all of our students are having access to uh, opportunities where they are um, producing authentic work and practicing their 21st century skills as well. So that's a, a good um, segue into the next slide. Was that a quote that you had just mentioned about yes. um, the one set of schools has certain functions and then another set could you, could, can I get a copy of that? Yes, I, and I'm happy to share all the articles you want about this, but yes, I, that, that is from one of the articles around deeper learning um, that's co-authored, I believe, this is that quote, I think is directly from Jal Mehta, um, but that article is uh, co-written by Jal Mehta and as well as Pedro Nagara. Um, so this image, which at first appears pretty confusing to look at, um, I'll explain in just a second, but I'll pause again and ask, how do we teach kids how to play baseball? Uh, usually by observation first, and then at that point, trial and error as far as skill training. And what skills, like is there an order to it, or how are we doing it? Uh, again, the baseball is so structured, so you have to teach them 
very basic running uh, from the foundational perspective before they even pick up a glove or a bat. Okay. Anyone else want to add to that? I think you go over what the game is about and then you give them instructions and the rules about the games before you take them out to the field and train them. Okay. Who's been to a Little League game? How does that look or compare to um, <laughs> the M MLB? Um, it, it's interesting because uh, you'll see certain um, players engage and others just picking, you know, grass or playing with dirt. <laughs> <laughs> so not everyone wants to be there, yeah. right? Um, but some of the features that, that I would really point out is that there, there is an overview, like you learn the rules, right? But you also are playing. It's not like I just teach you about baseball in a classroom and just teach you the rules, right? right? And it isn't that I just teach you how to run, and then we'll get to catching, right? You are practicing running the bases. You are practicing catching. You are practicing batting, right? And you're doing it on a smaller field, right? It is a much smaller field. You might start out with the T-ball the stand. Um, well, we call this playing the whole game, right? Kids are given the opportunity um, when learning sports more frequently to play the whole game. It isn't that you get to the exciting part once you've mastered how to run from, uh, run to, you know, between first base and second base. You are practicing all of that sort of in conjunction. And then it makes it more relevant to understand, oh, here's why I have to be a good, good at catching, right? Or here's why I have to be able to, to throw from the outfield all the way back to one of the bases, right? Um, so that's what we want to do here, right? It, it, I don't want it to be a linear process where we're just building knowledge, building, building knowledge, and then once you've mastered that, you get to do something really exciting. It is about saying those steps along the way, we have to create these micro opportunities for students to build knowledge, put it in the context of authentic work, layer on those 21st century skills. And then that in itself is also helping with that mastery aspect. And then you raise the bar, right? And you keep doing that. So it is the same thing that we start off with the t-ball stand, then even Little League gets harder as you move forward before you're playing in high school or college or something like that. So as, as I hand off to my, my other teammates, um, those are some of the, the big picture features that we want you to keep in mind as we keep moving through. Thank you, next slide. So as um, Preeti has shared, and you so eloquently shared yourselves on your experiences with assessments. Um, thank goodness, gone are the days that college and career readiness just means rote memorization or, um, you know, technical skills. Today, to be ready for college and career, it's really about um, being able to apply and transfer your classroom knowledge um, into real world experiences because we have no idea what our current, you know, third graders, what jobs they're going to be exposed to or will exist when they, when the time comes for them, you know, to enter the workforce. So like the building um, bricks that Preeti showed on the previous uh, slide, we think about deeper learning assessment co com components as these um, Lego blocks. And any strong assessment has all um, of these five components. So of course, the first one is this content, right? Content standards. It's really grounded in um, this knowledge that is cognitively demanding that students have to show they, they know and are able to apply. Um, like our middle school student shared in the video, Casey, she said she wants her teachers to share what does success criteria look like, right? When our students know what they're aiming for, they can meet that goal. Um, the third and the fourth blocks, I think, are really important and really tied to the work that learning and development has been doing and sharing with you about how do we close that opportunity gap. Um, when we offer students um, different learning approaches and do make the learning um, assessment authentic, that's when they are motivated. Um, we heard from Caleb who said, you know, my most exciting uh, point of the learning assessment was to be able to go out and build a budget in the way we saw fit in the city. Um, and you can see how excited he was about that choice and to be able to have that ability to do so. Um, those authentic... Sorry? Could you go a little bit deeper into the term authentic? I, the other parts I kind of got, but authentic, sure. I'm not quite... So, um, 
being authentic is having these real world experiences that students can latch on to. I, I often would hear myself being a language arts and social studies teacher in the past, heard students say, why are we hearing about ancient history? What does that have to do with today? So as a, an educator, if you're not able to translate you know, ancient history into why is it relevant and meaningful in their lives today, um, it has, it's not authentic, an authentic experience for them. They can't latch on to it. They're not going to be able to apply that learning to their life now. Um, and what's important is we want them um, to be critical thinkers in the world that they're currently living in. And if we don't provide that authentic space to do so and bring themselves into it, right, interject what they already know um, and the strengths that they have to build upon, uh, they're not gonna carry in, um, like, like you all, you're just remembering the Scantron experiences, not these greater, deeper learning experiences that we're hoping they will have. And that helps really our students who are Latino or students of African ancestry be successful. Um, Richard and I spent a full day today with uh, Russell and Rancho middle school teachers from the math and science departments and we actually heard just this um, from Miss Mai, a math teacher at Rancho, shared that she had a student who was failing her math class, but when she gave this deeper learning assessment, which was on linear equations and graphing um, some kind of image, I think the student ended up creating a, a or graphing an arrow, a 3D kind of arrow image, um, the student was able to do it. So had that student been given a, you know, a multiple choice type test, would not have been able to demonstrate her knowledge the way she was on this deeper learning assessment, and it was a Latina student. So when we say authentic, I think that was a long-winded way, board member Norwood, to, to, to share what I mean by that. No, thank you uh, for that. And one other quick question. I've heard you reference um, black and Latinx students uh, several times as a part of this. Um, are Eng should our English language learners also um, included in this scenario? I know one of the responsibilities is for us to when we identify English language learners, we want them to have the ability to verify, I'm not saying that right, but to make sure that they're using English as their native language by the time that they get to middle school so they have more elective options. Um, so do, do they also, deeper learning, there's a context to English language learners as well? Yes, so I would say um, what we are about is inclusion in our, in our district and um, not only for our English learners, but also for our special education students. And so um, least restrictive environments and, and that means providing these types of experiences to them. Uh, I see my colleagues want to jump in. If, um, if you go back to the third point, the open to different learner approaches, that would address our English language learners. And from their, from their perspective, they can um, dive into the material that we we're presenting, the assessments that we were giving to them. And, and they're within the, within the assessments themselves, there, there would be structures to address their needs. Thank you. Yes, there would be scaffolding, and I think that leads to that final Lego um, block, the learning experience in and of itself, really means that there are points throughout this assessment process where students are reflecting, right? So that metacognition, students are thinking about their own learning, what am I strong in, what do I need to grow in? They're getting feedback from their peers, from their teacher, um, and other experts possibly, and then they're able to revise. So again, it is supportive of all um, learning all students um, with different learning uh, capabilities. Uh, next slide, please. So again, just sharing with you deeper learning competencies um, doesn't have to just be for assessments, but just the type of teaching we are looking for and we do currently have in MUSD. Um, in the green, it is color coded. So the green area would be our cognitive skills that students need. Um, the blue is our interpersonal. So again, that's the collaboration piece that Caleb was uh, so excited to talk about, right? There's no arguing. <laughs> and then the orange is the intrapersonal. Again, um, if we're, we're trying to build students' self-agency um, and be able to really direct their own learning with some choice. Next slide, please. 
So in summary, um, deeper learning really is combining what we consider our rigorous content, which is our content standards, and really allowing students to be able to transfer that knowledge and apply that knowledge, but also building in the skills and mindsets. And I forgot to include, um, you know, to be college and career ready, we also have to be making sure that we are building student skills around social emotional learning. Um, and again, I've talked about this already, but they're interpersonal skills. Next slide, please. So, so what, right? Why, why does it matter and why did Preeti even start with asking you about your own experiences? Um, much like I think all of us here, um, our traditional tests or our experiences were with traditional tests. Um, and I heard board member Yip Shuan say she hated having to cram for those types of assessments. And I would agree, um, I'm, I'm half Mexican, half Japanese myself. And, board member no you also said it didn't feel like you know it should have equalized kind of us you know been, been standard with these standardized tests but you didn't know how you kind of fit in there and same with myself i did not do well when it came to these kinds of traditional tests thank goodness i had the ability to show my skills in other ways otherwise i don't think i would have gotten into the colleges that i was able to get into and 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 now advocate for the students like i, I get to every day here um, but those are really just multiple choice, you know, not a lot of cognitive demand. It's just this rote memorization. Um, you took it one time and I don't think any of us had an opportunity probably to ever retake that kind of assessment. Where we're looking at deeper learning assessments, again, they're high in cognitive demand. Students have to have a grasp of the content knowledge and skills um, to be able to do this type of assessment. They are working collaboratively with their peers and their teacher. They're receiving feedback, so it's not a one and done. They're actually throughout the process getting feedback, revising as they need to, to be able to um, succeed on these types of assessments. So on the next slide, um, Preeti started to talk about, and she, she did share some of how deeper learning means or leads to equitable outcomes, and Richard is gonna expand upon that. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, one way we talk, one way we um, look at equity is through salaries and incomes, and uh, we are we see that um, high school uh, graduates earn much less than um, college graduates, and and that's the one of the way they're keeping track record of equity. Another way is actually through the uh, National Association of Educational Progress, where they test students around the country annually and and continue to give us updates on how we're doing as a nation as far as education is concerned and when you look at the data that they they uh, they show and uh, um, they you can track it back to all the way back to 1998 and you can see there's an there's an, an achievement gap between our uh, historically underserved students and um, our white students uh, throughout the country um, so <clears throat> But when we really talk about under our historically underachieving students, or, or I say underserved, who are underachieving, or our ELs, or our SES students, we're, we generally think if they're falling behind, we need to put them in remediation. We need to put them in intervention. So that is like the only pathway for them. But we need to be thinking about how do we give them opportunity to experience critical thinking to a different level where they are building connections and as brain research says when they build connections they tend to remember more and it becomes more valuable and that not only do, are they building connections within their synapses of the brain but they're building connections to the community at large so and we want <clears throat> we want all students to have access to um, deeper learning opportunities and that's where that that's where um, Prudence Carter identifies one of the biggest gap is the opportunities for, the, for our underserved students and our historically disadvantaged and SES uh, students don't get a chance to do that because we just think about, oh, they need to build those foundational skills to get to a place. But with deeper learning assessments, we are building within the structure of the deeper learning um, a process where teachers come alongside students to help them through the next steps uh, of the learning. So, um, next slide, please. 
Okay, so when we talk about deeper learning, really we're talking about uh, exposing students to rigorous content. Usually these con this content is uh, reserved for gate students or higher achieving students, and our um, lower achieving students don't get a chance to do these critical thinking. And um, rigorous content is really found in Webb's de Depth of Knowledge, DOK, we call it DOK, DOK three and four, where in three and four, you're, you are problem solving, you have strategic thinking, you might require planning, and a way to um, work out problems. Um, and DLK4 is about creating and, and innovating, uh, bringing forth new ideas that have not been thought of before, or a different way of doing things. So, uh, and one way we can look at what these uh, depth of knowledge uh, uh, areas are like is to look at some game shows. Next slide, please. <laughs> well, we, I think we're all familiar with these game shows, right? Um, Jeopardy, DLK1, Recall, uh, I know this, give me a question, I have the answer. DLK2, I, I've studied culinary arts and now it's my turn to go and perform on Top Chef and supplying my skills in, within the context of what I learned. And, but we want students to have more opportunities with DLK3 and 4, like Survivor, man. <laughs> Have you ever thought about how you would survive on an island? I don't, I don't think I could make it because I, I, don't, I don't have some of those communication skills that are required for that. And then you have to know how to play the game. You, just because you're the last one standing doesn't always mean you're going to be the winner because there's still a final vote. So how are you, how are you planning, uh, how are you solving everyday problems, being left on an island, getting along with people? Oh, man, that's tough. <laughs> that's tough thinking and a lot to plan out over a course of several, several weeks, right? Um, uh, and then the next level is to go into Shark Tank. Well, I see a problem. Can I, do I have a way, uh, a system in pla a place to address the problem, or can I invent something to, to take care of the needs of that probably every other person needs? Or maybe we already have a can opener. Is there another way we can open a can? <laughs> the, and that's the type of thinking that might go on as we approach, as, as we look into DOK4. And, and when we build this from, from when, you, when you imagine this being taking place from K to 12, we're really building students' critical thinking muscles, right? They need, um, they need to be able to, bear, to carry this, he this weight, right? And, and be able to flex their muscle at the end of the, over time. So uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> another thing we are hoping to build with, uh, with the deeper learning assessment is that we are moving students away from being dependent, to be dependent thinkers or dependent learners. We want them to be more on the independent side. Now a dependent learner is a person who sits around and waits for a teacher to say, this is how it's done, now you go do it, this is what you need to do, or I don't know what to do, um, okay, let's start, let's start over, let's, go, take, let's break it down through the steps, waiting for the teacher to give instructions, and if they miss the instructions, waiting for the teacher to repeat the instructions, right? And, um, and so, but we really want them to be um, uh, independent learners in such a way that when we are presenting them with these assessments or these tasks and that are challenging and rigorous, they'll say, wait, wait for it, challenge accepted, <laughs> right? And then they'll say, and then they'll dive into this, dive into this learning, okay? But they already have a, a lot of the learning that they, a lot of the stuff that they will do in the assessments, they have already been taught to them. This is, the assessments would, allow them to prove that they know and understand the concepts that, the, that they've been taught. And they may start and then hit this pit where they struggle, but the resources, they, but they can identify their resources. Do they need to re do research, ask the teacher, ask peers, just, um, just know, their, um, know their academic resources as well as their human resources to get aid, to help them climb out of this pit. 
and, and that will help them with their mindset. Skills have already been developed in them. They draw upon multiple skills. And with this rigorous content together, they project themselves and climb out with a little bit more of knowledge. If you, if you look at where the, the two figures are at at the beginning versus the end, you notice that, that there are, the second figure is higher because now they also have strategies to get them out of similar situations, right? So, so we're not, so over time, just imagine having more and more opportunities to critically think, to critically work your way out of um, tough situations, what that builds in the, the person, autonomy, right? This, this, this self-directedness that I can achieve these things and I know how to get there. I know how to get from point A to point B, even if I fall into a pit. Yeah. Next slide. Yeah. Uh, sorry, Scott, if you don't mind going back one slide. I want to just connect this, these, the, the words and the image also back to that first, one of the first pictures I shared with you, the black and white picture of the classroom, right? So, so this isn't about, um, blame either on the teacher's end or the student's end, right? Like, oh, it's the student's fault that they're sitting there and, and just raising their hand and waiting for the teacher or the teacher's fault. Like, that's the way the system was originally designed, right? Many of our teachers grew up in a system that was very similar of, say, of a sage on the stage. One person is, uh, has the knowledge, is giving it out to students. So that, the way that that system was created these outcomes. Right? created dependent learners. Um, and what we're doing, and, and um, I think on one of our next slides, we're sharing um, some of our signature practices in MUSD. They're already starting to shift us to how to be independent learners um, and, and shifting what that system and the everyday classroom experience looks like so that students are um, coming away with strategies on saying, when I get stuck, here's what I do, right? So that student, um, Casey, when she shared, well, I had to learn how to use a new app, right? She didn't just wait for a manual. Most of our students, right now, when we are using new apps, we don't read the how-to manual. We're, we're sort of, you learn by trial and error, right? And you start figuring that out and you don't let the, the errors um, make you just shut down, right? But it's, it's through that recursive practice and finding those small successes that you get more and more confident for when the problems get bigger and bigger or harder and harder, right? So it is um, the design thinking, it is about learning about the resources that you have, the way that we try to teach students about math and saying when you get a problem, you don't know how to answer specifically or particularly a word problem. The strategy is write down what are your givens, right? What, what, what information do you have in the problem? What are you being asked to solve? Like, so how can you start to take those steps on your own um, before you're even reaching out to your peers or reaching out to your teachers for support? So that kind of sounds to me like simultaneous engagement. Whereas before, to your point, only one person can answer, only one person can speak from a stage standpoint. In this kind of expansive space, when you're talking about independent learning, it gives them the space to simultaneously engage and answer and, and, and come up with a solution. Yeah, and what that does with the teachers is maybe when you have student choice in that, part, in that equation, you have teachers who are learning alongside students and not necessarily teaching to students. Um, they, they'll, they'll support all their the strategies, the thinking. They would be doing the same thinking the students would do and maybe prompt them to, to make that same choice, those same choices or other choices or present their own perspective on what they can do, problem solve for themselves, right? Um, and then Casey, just to let you know that um, her final product is like a fifth iteration of what, what she designed for her wristband. So she scrapped her original design and that what her final product was something at, at the very end, like, you know, okay, I'm oh, stop there. It's, no. it's okay. Did you have a question? No, I just wanted to, I wanted to make sure that we could hear him clearly because when you speak on the mic, there's folks at home as well and if you're not speaking up, they can't hear, the, and there's most, some of your colleagues that are probably listening as well, trying to tune in and hear all the conversation. Yeah, just making sure that everybody can hear you clearly um, while you're speaking. All right, thank you, Superintendent. 
As you can see, we're super excited about this uh, topic, so we keep wanting to share more and more, but it is exciting, especially when you see how it impacts student learning. So um, in case anyone didn't hear um, what Richard shared, his student Casey, in her final product, it was her fifth iteration. Um, so it's giving students the space to continue their learning until they're satisfied um, with, with the product. So um, we've shared some of the deeper learning components. We've shared um, how it leads to equitable outcomes, but you don't have to take our word for it. There's a ton of studies out there. We just wanted to share one. Um, there was a, a study here in California with five I want to say, um, no, I'm sorry, 700 California students. Um, it was a five-year longitudinal study um, starting in 2008. There were three different schools, um, an urban school and a rural school that mirrored each other. They had a large minority population, an English learner population, and then um, compared with the wealthy and mostly white school. Um, the urban school decided to put together a deeper learning algebra and geometry course um, that really highlighted multiple dimensions of math concepts and approaches to problem solving um, and then brought in this self-assessment, this group assessment um, type of strategy that learn, deeper learning assessments can utilize. And they just within a year saw significant um, growth in their students. But by year four, you can see the urban school who was engaging in this, their students in this type of learning um, increased their student enrollment in calculus by 41% in comparison to the other two schools that only had a 27% enrollment rate. Uh, next slide, please. So why we're so excited is there are um, foundational bricks that we have already started here in MUSD at all of our sites. And if you go to our next slide, Scott, please. Um, this is just a snapshot of the great things that are happening here in MUSD um, and what we want to continue to build upon. Um, and through this work, we are hoping to close our opp opportunity gap. Um, we know, and, and I believe you've even heard from some of the students, well, today you did, and in previous board meetings, um, from students who have engaged in this type of learning. Um, and just the excitement, and like Preeti said, the eloquence with which they speak, it doesn't matter what level, grade level they are at, um, is inspiring and why we are so excited to speak with you today on deeper learning. Um, next slide, please. So what's April Academy? So April Academy was something we started last year. We engaged students, um, remind me, K-6. So I guess the question is two-part, right? What is April Academy and how come this is the first time I'm seeing the name? You, you, this is red, is it still working? Yes, okay. Um, it should, uh, it's part of what we did through ELOP, right? So this is how we're extending the number of days that students have access to it. Um, you've heard us talk about it. Maybe we used a uh, different language, um, but last year we shared out, um, we did April Academy with Calavera Sales, and we talked about the number of credits that students had received, as well as um, we did it for TK to six through the ELO pun, um, funding and we, we last year just piloted with three grade levels. We weren't able to staff all of the classes. So this year we will be doing it again um, and increasing to all six grade levels or seven grade levels uh, plus continuing at Calaveras House. And it's called April Academy, why? Because it happens, oh sorry, <laughs> happens during April break. It, so it was like the week long, um, it's, it's um, a condensed version of like summer school but happening it, during the April spring break that happens. And I wouldn't say like summer school, I would say like as the team uh, shared with us at the end of last summer, the summer programming where we're not doing traditional summer school, just um, similarly with the April Academy as you just described it was piloting something new for kids. Right, we are piloting project-based learning in both of the, the spaces so that they are practicing, uh, getting opportunities to learn those concrete um, uh, content skills, but in a context where there's application that's happening. Thank you.
Okay, I think this one's still working, thank you. Um, so on this slide, you will see um, the assessment system we are working towards. We currently, if you look to the left-hand side, the blue areas, um, we are employing assessments such as iReady, um, iExcel, writing benchmarks, um, teacher directed or teacher created, I should say, assessments. Um, but where deeper learning assessments lie are to the right hand side in the yellow areas. Um, and those that's the work that um, we are engaged with the elementary schools and the middle schools, and we'll share a little bit more specific um, what our timeline is for that work um, coming up. So I will pass this to Richard. Thank you. Okay. So right now we are in the process of aligning our uh, information. With, oh, sorry. <laughs> uh, right now we're in the middle of aligning our informational text um, uh, rubric. So oh, next slide. Sorry, that's a slide. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, and that's been happening uh, starting at uh, in September, and then it's going to go. Through, it has. Uh, it's continuing. We're continuing to. Um, uh, correct the rubric in such a way that it's very clear on the criteria for success for students. And then uh, we'll, we'll be moving this month, uh, on, starting with our training in, uh, at, on the 24th, moving towards in, uh, converting the, the rubric into a student-friendly rubric. And then, um, and also sharing with uh, my colleagues deeper learning and uh, having them understand the components of deeper learning and, um, and then looking at what our previous practices were and how can we leverage the, what we've already done before to create, to create uh, deeper learning assessments for, for this informational text writing. And uh, hopefully we are, would be able to um, finish at least uh, that component um, uh, of informational text where we would have a pre-assessment for, um, for our colleagues in the fall. What's that? Oh, sorry. Uh, so just, um, just to add, uh, the MUSD assessment system, we are not eliminating any of those assess assessments in there. Uh, we are going to um, bring more um, project-based learning assessments so that it is uh, um, inclusive and provides opportunities for all. We, we all want to speak on this one. Um, but to build on Richard and Raquel, right, is to say some of those places on the, the previous slide, there, then schools can have more autonomy there um, because that's not what we want to hold tight on what needs to be common. In terms of what I was talking about earlier with the opportunity gap and consistency, we want to get tight on saying that we have these common rubrics and then um, the tasks that we're creating have to be aligned to these rubrics. So the rubrics are the ones that not just outline the criteria for success, but incorporate those building blocks that are the key features of deeper learning tasks. Um, so that's where we want to go tight. So it isn't just about over assessing students, but figuring out, okay, where is it fine that our two middle schools like different formative assessments, right? I excel or I ready. And that's that's fine, that's up to how are the teachers, how are the departments using them, how are our students and families engaging with them. Um, but what we wanna make sure is that all students are then having access to these deeper learning assessments. So if that's where we go common, um, then that will ho also hopefully shift the instruction that's happening on a daily level. Next slide, please. So with our middle schools, um, Preeti and I started this work last October um, of 2021, actually not last October, two Octobers ago with our site um, middle school principals and talking about deeper learning because Rancho and Russell do not have a common assessment. Um, we did want to bring in our deeper learning assessments and wanted to be tight around our common rubric. So we partnered with Envision Learning Partners this year who have started to do um, professional development with our four content areas um, or four content departments um, at at Rancho and at Russell. So for example, today, our math and science departments um, joined together from both sites to do some professional uh, development around exactly what we're talking, about, 
talking with you today, deeper learning assessments and creating these common rubrics. Um, they started their own iteration and brainstorming around what their performance assessments could look like. And I can't wait to be here again next year to be able to share with you, um, you know, their pilot, have some student voice to tell you about um, the, the exciting experiences that they had because of this work. So this work will continue through March. Uh, next Tuesday, we'll be meeting with the ELA and social studies departments from both middle schools. Um, we have two more PDs planned for this year where they will pilot, um, you know, give the performance assessments, look at the student data, look at the rubrics and how it assessed what they had planned for. Um, and we will, you know, Im implement this uh, common rubric start or common rubric starting next year. For the high schools, we will start some initial planning um, next school year as well, because we do want this assessment system to be K-12, as we stated earlier in the presentation. And I think we will now field some questions and answers. You can go to the next slide, Scott. Well, I'd like to first of all, as the board members um, deliberate on what their questions may be, thank you for uh, putting this presentation together and sharing with us um, a K-12 um, experience in terms of looking at the different grade levels uh, as having 10 elementary schools, two middle schools, one comprehensive high school, continuation high school, middle college. See, there's a lot happening in Milpitas and sometimes not everybody's voice is heard uh, as it goes through this. So I wanna thank you for the effort that you guys are, have put forth um, in sharing this presentation of a desire for us to go deeper. Um, I also appreciated the fact that you identified on one of your slides how you saw some of the deeper learning happening as it associated with signature practices um, at the different school sites. Um, I would be curious to understand at some point what defines a signature practice and how deeper learning um, is associated with that and how does the instruction in each individual classroom uh, associate um, with that as far as that system because as people come and go out of systems they bring in different things and if there isn't uh, an infrastructure in place of these specific practices we can talk about this all we want, but next year you're gonna have 50 new teachers or whatever that number is and at the middle school or elementary school. And then that continuity that you desire is not um, gonna have the opportunity to be fulfilled. Um, I would also ask that um, you recognize the, uh, the strategic plan goals of the board um, you had mentioned uh, earlier on one of the strategic goals. Um, and as I look at them, I look at strategic goal number three and develop educational pathways that allow students or learners to apply their passions in learning for their future careers. Um, that language was argued over quite a bit, very intentional. And you don't see the terms, uh, you don't see college and career, you see pathway to their future career. So being thoughtful of the fact that because there was one slide that you shared about high school graduates in comparison to college graduates, but that, that continues to um, perpetuate that same inequity gap because we know that pathways to careers don't have to include college. And if you're talking about that uh, deeper learning, then people can realize while they're in high school that my pathway to success if they're actually applying what you're talking about, is gonna show them that I don't have to go to college. Um, I may want to because it's gonna give me additional information, but there are other pathways to opportunity, entrepreneurship, uh, tradesmanship, a number of different ways that they can get there. And the reason why the strategic goals were designed the way that they were to be equitable and inclusive in the bigger picture. So those are some of the things that I wanna share. I got a ton of notes, so that means you know, you guys have did a really good job, so thank you. So one of the things that I would like to hear from your study is, uh, what are some of the challenges uh, as far as with a deeper learning adoption? You want us to share now? <laughs> <laughs> Mike. 
You also have Ms. Perkins behind you. <laughs> Do you want to share? <laughs> she might be able to give us. No? Okay. So, I, I, you know, I think the challenges are in that it, we're talking about assessments, but it's about instruction and assessments, right? So it's change. Anytime we are dealing with change, um, that's difficult, right? Because there's there's loss of the stuff that you've been doing. Um, there's new learning that's involved. It's hard. Um, so that's why I think we as a district really want to be strategic about where are we going to be tight and say, yep, we all need to roll up our sleeves and, and engage in this new work and this new learning together. Um, and where where is there room for autonomy and freedom and, and um, doing things you know keeping some of those best practices that we've had along the way so i don't i think that sort of starts to answer your question and and the other place that we are straddling um the culture of both tight loose or autonomy and consistency is saying we're going to be especially at the middle school level and and then as we move into high school, tight on those rubrics, um, making sure those are high quality rubrics, uh, but that they're also written so that different teachers can have different assessments, right? So the, the writing prompt that I give in my English class doesn't have to be the exact same writing prompt um, that my uh, neighboring teacher, whether it's in my school or at the middle school across, um, across town, they don't have to be the same, but we can still have common rubrics so we can evaluate each other's student assignments. We can still come together and look at um, data and student outcomes and student learning. And then that's a way that learning is happening both for our kids through the assessment, but then also for our teachers by looking at that student work. So all of that is both exciting and challenging because it's, it's a different way of doing things. I think I would just add on that um, because we know this is challenging work and um, like board member Norwood said, how will we ensure that this work continues? So at the middle school level, we invited all teachers from those four content areas to join the professional, professional development so they have voice um, and agency in what's being developed because you know, like, like our students, we don't want to just give them something and expect them to implement it. We want them to have ownership and voice in what's being created. Um, so that's been very important to us. And I think what was exciting also today was to see that they're grasping on to the good work that they're already doing and expanding upon that. So they're not pulling, having to pull things from, you know, from the air. So it's a, 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 a major shift. It's just really adding on the good work that's already happening. At the elementary level, um, it's a gradual shift, and things are already in place. So we've got like over 700 students like participating in Botball Junior Advanced Project-Based Learning. So these shifts are gradual. They've started uh, several years ago. It, we're we're going to get there. When I say gradual, these infrastructures are taking place, and we're starting at the young, at the very youngest um, grade. And the youngest grade, and the youngest grade is what? PK. So then uh, in that conversation, right, part of that is just a, another way to define engagement versus just the straight outcome, right? Um, getting the, the student more engaged, more activities um, to, to have a deeper understanding. You're correct. So today, um, we, you would think you were in our professional development today because we talked not only about the outcome and what we want the product to be at the end of the deeper learning assessment, but also what are the, the checkpoints or what are the lessons that are happening up to that. Um, and so that's what Preeti had touched upon earlier. It's not just about um, a shift in the assessments, but there, there does require some shift in, in the lessons or the way we are engaging students the way you stated. So that, that brings a question that, um, and I'm not sure if this is contradictory, um, because we have signature practices and we have pockets of deeper learning. We're talking about how we um, have deeper learning across the district um, in all, and we're, and we're talking about deeper learning um, in all classrooms, but we're not there. And 
we have the we have change as a part of it. So there's some things there that kind of can have me concerned about how we have the ex the opportunity or the op to execute this within a reasonable time frame because of the constant change um, um, and the wide variety of signature practices that we have across the district. I know the goal is never to have everybody do the same thing because then you're telling them and you're, you're, cre you're creating a scenario where our instructors are basically dependent learners because you're telling them, so you're trying to balance that dependent learner versus the independent learner. So at, at some point, I would probably be interested in the next conversation about how you see it per permeating over a um, over time, three months, six months. I know you showed some timelines, but again, there's a lot of moving parts in those timelines, and to, to see something more concrete um, as, as a part of it, I think would be very helpful um, as it carries on. Yeah, um, I want to say uh, thank you so much for the presentation. Um, so going back to the April's assessment, is that what, what it's called, the April assessment? April, April Academy. Academy. Academy, sorry, yeah. I mean, I think it's a, a wonderful idea. Um, how did you guys come up with it, and, and was this like a special targeted group? How did you guys reach out to these students? Uh, yeah, so, so it came last, we started it last year as a pilot, and it started because we knew that we were going to start getting the ELOP um, funding, so we had money, but also then the requirement for expanded, um, expanding the number of days that we give students. So um, it's an idea that I brought with me from Massachusetts, uh, where we used to do acceleration academies um, during the February and the April breaks. Um, it's, it's not just a Massachusetts idea. I think other places have also um, taken it on. The idea there was originally about like, how do we do that very intensive test prep leading up to the state testing? Um, so we were stealing the idea of this is an a time that we can um, work with students, um, that students and families may be interested and, and want a place to be. Um, how do we also select and recruit teachers that are um, the most excited? It's an opportunity to, to be very clear about, like, we're trying some changes um, or instructional shifts here. Um, this is what we want to do, right? So we did PD for our teachers. Um, they, they also were involved in selecting the units that we decided to move forward with. And the idea is also that like, as they are practicing and trying this out it, through the April Academy, then they might take those shifts back into their own classrooms. Um, so I, am I answering your question of like, it's sort of coming from other practices and then with the opportunity that was presented to us here through the ELOP funding. And how many students were there? I have to remember, I think we had about 250 last year, a little bit less than that. I think we did two classrooms at the, so I think it was about, yeah, two, so I, I, I think it was like first grade, third grade, and, and sixth grade. Um, and then we'll be kicking that off again this year and trying to make sure we hit all of the grade levels. Again, it does depend on like student and parent interest, our teacher interest. So there's multiple different variables at play to get it off the ground. Okay. Will there be a February Academy? Uh, right now, we don't have the capacity to be running at both of the times. Um, you know, also recognizing last year, we, you know, we, our teachers were very burnt out and exhausted, so getting April Academy off the ground was a big feat, and I, I think there is still some of that lingering here um, this year. And then the, this year, we also have the added um, obstacle of the construction that is happening, right? So it's also about making sure we have sites that are available. Um, some of the, the big construction that's taking place is actually requires us to shut down all of our systems, our um, phone systems and others. So we, uh, so it's not just like physical construction that's happening, okay. um, but the, those are the other pieces at play. Okay. And then also um, February, we call that winter break. Yeah. Um, that's during President's Week. Mm -hmm. And technically two of those days are holidays, so you really only have three days that week in comparison to five days um, in the April Academy. 
so that talks a lot about the time because uh, and what you presented talked a lot about space space and opportunity but there's also that time gap as well uh, as well you know um, again we talk about challenges right that that's also a challenge to deepen learning right how much patience do we have for our students to really absorb the materials yeah and the the other challenge that i would add is just um getting substitutes for PD, right? So one of the your your questions is like, how will we make sure this doesn't fall away next year, right? Like, how do we continually, the, what rubrics require is ongoing calibration. Every time you have new people in the room, you have to recalibrate. And that's part of the learning process also for teachers. Um, so it, it has been difficult despite the best efforts of our HR team to also make sure that we have enough subs. We're getting better at it, right? But there's a, a shortage sort of across the state for that. Um, so there are different times that you can have the best PD planned, but then we couldn't get all the people in the room that we needed in the room. Jonathan, question for you. Um, do, um, or superintendent, oh, one of, Do district, do school districts have uh, agreements or HR agreements with staff to, to do multi-year contracts to work on certain things? What do you mean by multi-year contracts? Like, for example, let's say we agree that in order for us to get the deeper learning assessments completely through the district, we would need this team to be together for three years. So are you talking about, like, when you say contract, are you talking about the collective bargaining agreement, or are you talking about an employee's contract for work? I'm not sure. I'm just thinking about if I want this to happen and these three folks, we need these four folks to be together for three years. Just raise your right hand, say, I solemnly swear. Because <laughs> yeah, there really is no guarantee, right? People come and go, but as we lift our people up and retain and encourage and value the work that they're doing and, and you budget what you want, right? Your budget says this is what I value. So that would be my two cents to that. I was being a little flip there at the beginning, yeah, no. but we want them to be together to continue this work so we can track our data, correct? Right. And, and they're um, the only employee who actually has a contract, a written out long contract is the superintendent. The rest of the employees, uh, they follow either the handbook, if we're talking about the management association, or the collective bargaining agreement. And then they follow the salary schedule. Um, one other piece I heard in your question was, how do we, it, what I was taking from your question is, do we also have some sort of a contract with educators for when we are trying to do plans? and. In a way we do, it's a big umbrella, but in the collective bargaining agreement, it used to be on page 100. I'm not sure where it is now since the um, contract has changed many times. But there is a clause in there that says that whenever the district has a new training that it wants to do across the board, and it's required that everybody does it, if we can't do it on a PD day, if we can't do it during the work day through the use of subs, and um, it's going to take, like, say, a series of two hours after school or six hours on a um, Saturday. Then we have an agreed upon amount that we will pay for that to happen. What I would add to what both um, Superintendent Jordan and, and Assistant Superintendent Brunson are sharing is. I haven't, I haven't thought of the angle of contracts, but um, is is to think, I, I, we try to think strategically and think about structures that are in place, right? So the team um, that Richard and Marissa are working with, um, as well as Richard and Raquel, we asked at the elementary level for our um, principals to nominate teacher leaders on campus, teachers who are also then facilitating PLC work in their at their schools and with their grade levels so that we can think about, okay, how are you doing this learning? How are you going to share it out with other people? Um, so then next year, even if it's a different person who comes onto the team, it's not brand new learning that they have, right? So at the middle school level, we are intentionally making sure that we have our department um, 
chairs there as well as other interested teachers, but we want them to have mechanisms to take the learning that they're doing here with L&D back to their school sites um, and to continue that and, and so that people can come on and off the team. Um, the one place that, that I guess to your point about continuity um, or contracts is in thinking about a, a role like Richard's um, where we have a, a teacher on special assignment and we know that this deeper learning work is multi-year work. It is, his role is currently grant funded, um, but we have worked together with um, uh, business services and the superintendent to say, okay, these grants grants we want to use, their multi-year grants, and we want to use them to uh, think about his role not as an annual role, but one that we know will take multiple years um, to see the work to fruition. So Superintendent, part of what I'm kind of hearing is when you had launched um, C2C, it was about um, the um, district staff or the district teachers um, and others being able to share their practices um, and, re and retain the, the knowledge or the direction that we were going in terms of how to educate um, or share knowledge across uh, the campuses. And it sounds like some of the things that they're saying is like a 2.0 version of it if we want to get into the deeper, if we want the deeper learning uh, assessment piece and instruction to kind of permeate through the district over time. Are you? suggesting that the colleague to colleague uh, platform is one place where we can also house like videos and that kind of thing and also provide on demand training so that it permeates that um, that's up for you guys to decide because where I'm at is liking what I'm hearing and saying okay I have to close my eyes and next year you may not be he you you know, I mean, and then all of a sudden I'm like, well, what happened to, because I get to ask that question a lot. I've got notes from like 2016. Damon, I still have your copy of Closing the Achievement Gap when you were on that committee. What year was that? That is like 20, I think it was like 20, 2007, 2008. That never kind of reached its, because of, change and so now i hear this and i'm trying to uh infuse the fact that please incorporate that concern and there's some building blocks that the superintendent have put in place to 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 try to make us uh, uh future proof for some of that uh moving forward so that you can actually see this come to fruition um and then we can evaluate because until it comes to fruition in some way uh, we won't be able to evaluate where it comes to SBAC scores and all attendance and all those other things because you've also said the quality of learning and the space that the kids in affects their attendance, their engagement, their fidelity and all those other things. So again, I want to thank you all uh, for your time. I would love to be able to continue this conversation for another half an hour or so, uh, but we have other uh, board uh, items. Um, are there any questions from uh, any other questions from uh, the board? One quick question um, that I have. Actually, uh, thank you for the presentation. I think I was wondering what, how the oh, capstone Marcos. project is kind of, uh, you know, um, part of the assessment from the middle school that you have incorporated, because not all the students from the high school would be out there. So how, how, how does it work? The capstone project that we um, named for middle college, how, how does that work? Um, so that's actually a two-year project. Um, I'm sorry that Carissa has left. I'm stealing her thunder. Um, because it's, it's, it's really one of uh, the most beautiful projects, I think, that we have in Milpitas Unified. Um, but it's a two-year project where students are, uh, it's, a, it's a great culminating project because students are, from their coursework, deciding on a community-based problem. Um, and then they are doing research around it. Um, then they are talking to industry leaders around it and then putting together their own solution around that and then working on executing that. Sure, thank you so much. Thank you so much for the sure. discussion. Superintendent, any last word? Oh. 
I'm just going to add on to Prithi as I was interviewing one of the students. Um, that vi video will be available for you to watch, and you can um, see his community impact, pro what he's working on on his community impact project, and that was part of his capstone. Thank you so much again. Thank you very much. And uh, there were a lot of um, points that you brought up that generated more ideas. Uh, one I'll just leave with, which is when you spoke about the signature practices and President Norway talked about our strategic goals, I thought that's a great opportunity for two things to happen. One is, um, as you asked about how do we define a signature practice, our signature practices have evolved uh, organically, and this gives us the opportunity to uh, formalize them and uh, document what's working really well, and also look at, so where are the deeper learning strategies reflected, and where can they go deeper? And then the other piece with the strategic goals is um, something I'll be talking more about with the board and also um, with many of our community members and staff members and students is that I uh, would like to go in the direction of changing our strategic goals to be called the strategic commitments. And, um, and as we think about deeper learning, where that falls into our, we mentioned at the beginning strategic goal number four and then strategic goal number three with the pathways is certainly there. And just one last thing about how we can maintain our team is to deepen our uh, culture and climate and continue to work on it becoming stronger. And that's with our strategic goal number one, build a culture we. And I echo what your sentiments and greatly appreciate the team that we have. Thank you. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Hopefully this was helpful. Thank you. And with that, we'll move to item six, and that's review and approve the closed session agenda. Is there a motion? Move to approve the closed session agenda. We have a motion to approve the closed session agenda. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none. Motion carries. Move to closed session. Thank you.
You ready on the right? We ready? Ready on the left? Mm -hmm. Awesome. Good evening again, Mel Peters. I'm your 2023 board president, Chris Norwood. Welcome to this meeting of the Melpitas Unified School District Board of Education. We appreciate your attendance and participation in our education proceedings, which align with the guidelines set forth by the Ralph M. Brown Act for open meetings. Tune into our hybrid style meetings online, either on Zoom or YouTube or in person inside our boardroom. Public comments can be made when you're logged into Zoom or if you're in person. YouTube is a listen only option. If you're un unavailable or unable to do either of these, please, written, please visit our written, comments, written public comments webpage for instructions on how to submit your written comment. For our virtual audience, you will see instructions for public comment on your screen. Our communication specialist will briefly go over them. For our in-person audience, please go to the podium when you are called upon. Instructions for both are listed on each agenda. There are copies available at the back table. One public comment per person is allowed for each item. Our communication specialist will take it from here. Thank you so much, President Norwood. Uh, so for public comments, for those of you here in attendance at Randall uh, World Languages School, there are green cards at the back of the row there. You fill that out, hand it to me, and I'll relay it over to the board president. Uh, he'll call on those um, in the order they are received. For our online audience, you must be registered on Zoom. Uh, you will see a hand icon by your name to indicate your request. You'll click that. We will call on the, na the names in the order they are received. Listen for your name, and we will tell you when your audio is active. You'll take yourself off mute. You'll have two minutes to speak. And lastly, we just ask that uh, you please be patient. The board president will call for any public comment at the appropriate time. Members of the public may address the board on any subject that does not appear on tonight's agenda. However, provisions of the Brown Act, Government Code 54954.2a and point three preclude any action. As an unagendized item, no response is required from the board or district staff and no action can be taken. However, the board may instruct the superintendent to agendize the item for a future meeting. Please note that the Brown Act Government Code Section 54954.3 prohibits members of the board in commenting or engaging in discussion during the public comment portion of the agenda, except when seeking clarification on a point made by the speaker, provide a reference to staff members for factual information, or request a staff member to report back to the board on any matter at a subsequent <coughs> meeting. We do offer special accommodations for our board meetings. If you do need a special accommodation, we please ask that you contact the superintendent's office at least two business days in advance. Our meetings are broadcast live on both Zoom and YouTube and are recorded. Those recordings are available on our district website, www.musd.org. Closed captioning is available on the Zoom platform. You click the closed captioning icon and live transcription will appear on your screen. Lastly, if there are any additional documents that were not part of the agenda, those are public records and available upon request. Back to you, President Norwood. Thank you. Um, our board meeting today started at 4.30 and we did provide, did do the roll call uh, for the board and now we have to do the roll call for our student board reps. Uh, Mira Bakta. Here. Ariana Rocha. Uh, Ariana, let me know that she was under the weather today, so she wasn't. Thank you. Um, Nikita Sharma. Here. Thank you. Um, agenda item 10, closed session announcement. In closed session, the Board of Trustees unanimously approved the superintendent's recommendation for the certificated management position of coordinated second early childhood development and community engagement. Thank you. Thank you. Item 11, review and approve the open session agenda. Is there a motion? Move to approve. Second. We have a motion and a second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Seeing none. Motion carries. Now it is time for the flag salute. Good evening, 
morning, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Cadet Su, and today I'm being accompanied by Cadet Chavez. Please rise for the flag salute, and please remove all hats and hoods. The flag is to your right. Ready? Begin. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Please be seated. Thank you. Thank you and have a good night. Thank you. Comments from the public. And we have comments from the public at this time. Are there any comments from the public online, Scott? Uh, we have no hands raised for online comment at this time. Thank you. Well, let's start with uh, Yvonne Rodriguez. Hi, um, my name is Yvonne Rodriguez. I'm speaking for uh, Mrs. Rodriguez. Um, I think it's um, kind of weird that you guys are letting her go. Uh, we wish that you guys would keep her. Uh, we have three boys that have been through the system. Diego Rodriguez is our youngest. We have two that went to college, graduated from Milpitas High School and um, went on to college. Um, sorry. <laughs> Mrs. Rodriguez has went up for bat for my son so many times because teachers wouldn't respond to our emails. And she did her best. Um, to fight like hey they need their information we still it took a long time for them to respond to us but Miss Rodriguez always came through for us and she would always make sure that the kids our son needed what he needed and if he was struggling he would get the extra help um, but the teachers aren't always responsive so she's always tried her best he also has a sickness but um, he does have a learning disability so he needs all the help he can get and sometimes it's just hard that no one responds so mrs rodriguez goes for bat for us and it takes a little while but we do get our stuff done um so um she she doesn't fall far from the um, tree like the apple doesn't fall from far from the tree like mrs her mom um she's just like her she helps it any way she can all the kids like her from what i know and she's ready to help anyone that they need help Thank you. Thank you. It's not easy standing up there, so it's okay to give them a round of applause for that effort. Uh, Rosanna Rodriguez. So my name is Rosanna Rodriguez. I'm a former um, alumni from OPS High as well. Um, I wanna start with a quote, building relationships with students is by far the most important thing a teacher can do. Without a solid foundation and relationships built on trust and respect, no quality learning will happen within the classroom. Anthony Hilton. First, I would like to thank Ms. Rodriguez for her endless support that she has provided my son and I over the last year and a half that has been attending MHS. Also for communicating through emails and text messages, even if, it was, even if it was over the weekend. Most importantly, for building a relationship with my son to where he is comfortable enough to talk to her when struggling in a class. I remember when my, first, when my son first started at MOPS High, he was very nervous. However, we felt at ease when we got notification that Ms. Rodriguez was going to be his case manager. Word around campus was that she was a fabulous teacher and cares a lot about her students and their success. I have also heard from other students that one point they were not expect expected to graduate on time and now they are expected to graduate with a class. As a parent, I would like to share the frustration that I have felt in the past when there's no communication coming back from a teacher. Last year, my son struggled in most of his classes. I remember sending endless emails to my students' teachers expressing my concerns and not receiving a reply back. I tell my student to talk to his teachers and he would come home telling me that they just brushed him off or that he felt as if they didn't care. This made it harder for him to succeed in their classes, which caused him to fall further behind. Thankfully, Ms. Rodriguez was able to help us get his grades up. He is now graduating on time. 
Um, as an educator, I can tell you firsthand that we are not able to teach a student if we do not touch their heart. Some of these students that occupy these desks within our classroom don't have a cheerleading team, someone to support them or even remind them that there's a light at the end of the tunnel, tunnel and to keep pushing because the one thing that no one can take from me is your education. If she is relocated, I hope that there is another teacher that students can confide in. Ash Ames. Hello, my name is Ash Ames. I've spoken at a board meeting every school year since entering high school, and I am here once again to speak to you about matters involving my high school. Over the course of this school year and the last, I have noticed that the L building bathrooms have been closed after lunch more often than not. Students have asked the teachers if there's a schedule for when it is open, and we have been informed that there is not. When we ask the other faculty why it is closed, we are informed that it is due to drug use. The bathrooms are closed to stop the use of drugs, yet that does nothing to solve that does nothing but harm those who have done nothing wrong. The few students who use drugs will just relocate to a different bathroom. Where will it stop? When all the bathrooms are closed? This does not solve the issue but punish those who aren't involved. Those in L building have lost the closest bathroom to them and now have to travel further to use the bathroom. And if those bathrooms are closed, they have to go across the campus to use the nearest bathroom. Most teachers only allow the students five minutes to use the bathroom. And it takes five minutes to go across campus to use those bathrooms. Some students have anxiety and not having access to a bathroom can trigger it and make it harder for them to learn. These aren't students doing drugs, but students trying to learn. My school has seven security guards now, which is the most it's ever had. And this is the solution that MHS has come to. Lock the bathrooms instead of stopping the drug use. We aren't the staff who have keys to the bathrooms whenever they need to go. We're the students who want the access we properly deserve. Please think about this. Locking the bathrooms after lunch doesn't solve anything. It just harms the innocent who know nothing about this. Thank you for your time. Juan Garay. I'll try to speak up. All right, so I'm talking about Mr. Rodriguez too. Uh, removing Ms. Rodriguez from MHS Special Ed is a huge mistake. She is a key part of a team that is succeeding in an environment that is difficult to succeed in. When I first heard about this, I thought it was just another teacher transfer, but then I heard that people had to stop talking about it, and I started to think that something else was going on. I don't know who's behind it, uh, but because uh, most of you guys are new, I get the feeling that someone behind this uh, is manipulating you into making a really dumb decision. Don't move, Ms. Rodriguez, even at the end of the year. We will be watching, and you are just hurting the kids that are most in need. Uh, for the new people, don't let the first thing you do be uh, of any significance be something so ugly. I live in this town my whole life, attended preschools, Anchor, Rancho, MHS, and I feel ashamed that a school district I was so proud of would hurt my family and friends in this way. Keep MHS special ed how it is and move on to something else. Please go to the school and see for yourselves how much Mrs. Rodriguez positively impacts the kids and prove to us that you guys actually believe in the culture of we. I have, I have ease and a sense of relief knowing that MHS special ed teachers are watching out for my kid. Thank you. Angela Garay. Am I pronouncing that last name correctly? Garay. Okay, thank you. Right. 
My daughter has been in the Mopita School District for five years. The first three years were rocky. I'm speaking on Ms. Rodriguez, by the way. Um, the first three years were rocky, inexperienced and non-existent or constant rotating RSP staff, special education that just wasn't there, didn't know what they were doing. We were very apprehensive to continue into high school with this school district. Our first interaction with the MHS at special ed staff eased our fears. Mrs. Rodriguez has been an important part of that ease and security the staff has. They work well together. She truly cares about the kids. They are her kids too. The staff works so well together in finding a perfect path for our kids. Ms. Rodriguez has stood up for my daughter time and time again, pushing for her support in regular classes. She encourages her to speak up, gives her confidence, and advocate for herself. With the help and support of Ms. Rodriguez, our daughter is now in mostly regular classes and working towards grade level mastery. She is not only an excellent educator, she's also a safe haven for children, helping with anxiety, emotional problems, and sometimes even family issues. To disrupt this great unit of a high school, at a high school level, special education department would be a detriment to so many kids who need her. Who will replace her? This is not something that many people volunteer for. Look at the support she has now. It's not parent-led, this is led by her kids. Kids who are disadvantaged sometimes emotionally, socially, economically, and learning and physically disabled. They are finding their voices and asking for help. They need a stable environment to prosper and become successful adults, maybe even educators one day. Don't let these kids down. We need Ms. Rodriguez. Thank you. Raul Cuede, I might, have, I might have not done that too well. And how do I pronounce your last name? Uh, Ovidio. Ovidio. Oh, oh, Ovidio. Thank you. I've been to Milpitas High School for about, say, three years. I'm a junior of uh, Katie's Rodriguez, and um, my sophomore year, I was struggling very heavily and I was even thinking about dropping out until I got put in her caseload. She has helped me out very much and motivated me to keep pushing and keep going with my uh, subjects that I've been filling in. Uh, there's this class I've been struggling in a lot with math and right now it's working out perfectly. I am grateful that you guys decided to keep her for a year but I hope that you guys keep her longer not just for me but for other students that have disabilities like me. She's been very helpful and motivated, and uh, I just want to keep her here. I wish we had multiple people like Rodriguez, but there's not a lot of people like Rodriguez, which is why I think it's a very bad idea to move her out of high school. Thank you. Um, and we have uh, two people that want to speak together. We have Arita Narayan and Anaya Sarinava. Sorry. Sarinavasa. Uh, hi, my name is Arita. I'm in JV soccer, so Ms. Rodriguez is Coach Katie to me. Um, I've only known her because of soccer, but once I joined soccer, I realized she's the person who helps MHS in one of the best ways. She keeps it very safe. Before I joined, I had no idea who she was, and once I did, I realized. She's the teacher who makes sure that everyone goes to their classes. She makes sure that we keep our grades on top. Even though we're a student athlete, she keeps student first. She checks up on all of us all the time. And it's shown by how many people are here that are students that she does care a lot, which is very rare in MHS because most teachers, they dismiss how students feel a lot. They do not make us feel included. They do not care about what happens outside of school that's not in their class. She does. Even if she's not our teacher, she'll check up, she checks our grades, and she makes sure that we're always okay. 
And I think that's a great thing for students to have at MHS. So for her to leave after this year would be very unfair to incoming MHS students and the rest of us who still have to stay here for another two years. So I think that's a really big mistake to remove her because she helps everyone, not only her students, a great amount. Um, my name is Ananya and I'm also in JV soccer. And I didn't know a lot about Coach Katie before soccer season started this year. But after season started, I've seen a lot of people, even during practice, who've had very off days that wait till Coach Katie comes to practice, talk to her about, her pro about their problems, and they're fine after practice. I've also seen a lo lot of people go to her during break, during lunch, during, during school, just to talk about their problems to make them feel better. And Coach Katie is, as a coach, not only cares about how we're playing, but also cares about our grades and held a whole week of tutoring before finals so we don't fail. Elijah Gonzalez. Elijah, it'll go up. Hi, my name is Elijah Gonzalez. I'm one of Mrs. Rodriguez's students. I've been in her class since my sophomore year. She's helped me with, through, through so much through the past two years, not with just school, but in life. Uh, she helped me get back on track from almost failing to now being able to graduate on time and achieve my lifetime goal. Uh, so please just don't make her leave. You're not just hurting my it's not just hurting me, but you're hurting my fellow classmates by taking her away. And she isn't finished impacting and helping change students' lives for the better and getting them back on track or stay on track. Thank you. Scott, are there any additional comments? Uh, my name is Joretta Gutierrez, and I'm in JV soccer. Uh, this year, I met Ms. Rodriguez during soccer tryouts. Um, and even though I was a complete mess during tryouts, I was still able to make it to the JV soccer team. Um, overall, I wasn't really sure what positions I wanted to play because last year I was on the team but played in a position I wasn't really comfortable with because overall I did feel like playing goalie but I never felt like I could actually play and I didn't want to leave the team down since there was already a goalie. Um, I gave up on being goalie about two years ago, but this year I just thought why not try again and see if I could improve. Um, I decided to ask Coach Katie if I could be a goalie too, and she said, of course. She gave me a chance, and I've actually become a better player. Not only that, I've also improved a lot in my grades ever since, since she's really helpful and did help me study for my finals when I would usually just go home and not really do much. But the week that she gave us, I did a whole lot of work and actually got caught up in a lot of my classes. Overall, she's helped me become a better student and a player, but also being in her class is a very comfort spot for me since I, sometimes I, don't be, I, I won't be having my great days and she'll always be there and be there to help a student out. Overall, I think if, we leave, if Coach Katie leaves, school wouldn't be the same for me or for my classmates or teammates. Thank you. Uh, Nicholas Marine. Uh, I am Nico Marine. Uh, Miss Katie, she's been my case manager for since sophomore year. I am a junior now. Um, she has taught me how to advocate for myself. How important, like. Like she will need me. Like I will need her a lot next year. 
I like to graduate. Like, she's helped me push myself to be a better baseball player, a better person, and like, I've just had a special bond with her. And, like, she's always advocating for me. It's like I really need her for like my next two years. Thank you. Wyatt Kazilis. Hello, everyone. I am a senior at uh, MHS. I am uh, under Ms. Ms. Rodriguez's caseload. So um, I came here to speak for myself and to, as well as every other um, student in the class. We have bonded and become a family, and we all come from different different places, different walks of life through this class and through Katie Rodriguez. We've learned from each other and seen how similar we are from each other. Um, and isn't that what school is? To socialize, to mingle with people and to um, build bonds, build relationships and to be with each other. Through personal matters and through personal issues, Katie Rodriguez, Miss Rodriguez has helped me through a majority of my high school career and through myself personally. And for just how everything has been going, she is, as I said, a second mother to me. And I believe a majority of the students under her caseload in all of her classes and in students outside of her classes that she has supported as well as um, the soccer team, she's been helpful and caring for all the students and treating the students as her own children. And I don't believe that she should be taken away from us. So, that's all I have. Thank you. Melody? Hi, my name is Melody Marin. This is my son, Nicolas Marin. He spoke just a little bit ago. I just wanted to thank Miss Katie. Um, she's helped Nico so much with first off learning what his learning disability was and understanding it and how to advocate for himself. So he has a very special bond with her. Very, very important year coming up next year. He'll be a senior and um, he relies on her. She pushes him along with us as a parent. <laughs> But we have a special bond and it's very important. Not only does he need her, but all the other students that are here need her. Thank you. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank all the students that came to speak today at the board meeting and sharing uh, your um, experience with Ms. Rodriguez. Some of the things that I heard, I took notes on as far as how she worked with you was self-advocacy, um, relationship building, responsiveness, genuine connection, supporting parents uh, in a number of different ways. And by you, by you being here today, that is a reflection of that. So again, I would like to give our students that came out uh, to speak at the board one more round of applause. <laughs> is, are there any direction recommendations from other board members before I uh, speak, talk, make a recommendation to the superintendent. So um, the recommendation superintendent that you've heard uh, in cabinet, you've heard uh, the staff members, excuse me, you've heard the parents and you've also heard the students advocacy and some of the things that we've talked about in terms of how we build those relationships, those characteristics um, exist in these students relationship uh, with uh, Ms. Rodriguez without a uh, clear understanding prior to this moment and all of these people coming to the board to understand what's going on, I'd like to point out the characteristics and the concerns that the students have at Melpitas High School um, and determine how we can support or how they can be better supported uh, moving forward as this matter continues to work towards uh, a resolution. And if the superintendent has anything else to share at this point, uh, it would be appreciated. Thank you, President Norwood, and I echo uh, your sentiments about 
the importance of our students advocating for themselves. And uh, with our last uh, young man who spoke, I, the thought that came to me is that Ms. Rodriguez has certainly uh, done what she's set out to do. In fact, I was talking with her and a group of other people earlier today, and she talked about how her kids are her kids, and uh, her own children by birth know that her kids in school are their um, brothers and sisters, she said. So um, it's very gratifying to hear from each of you students and also parents about how much of an impact a teacher has made on your, um, on your lives at school and your trajectory for the future. And I do hope that all of our teachers who have uh, made an impact on students and families that they too at one point during this year will hear from students and parents either directly or through a letter or an email because it's so important that teachers get to hear how the effort and investment that they put into teaching pays off. And um, I did hear, uh, I think one person knows that Ms. Rodriguez is not uh, being transferred this year. Um, and that uh, the future for next year is um, something that we'll continue to work on. And it is quite evident that Ms. Rodriguez is a teacher who has an impact that we want to see uh, continue in Milpitas Unified. As far as some of the other things, President Norwood, that I, I also heard that uh, students brought up, um, besides the L building being closed, is uh, that we need to figure out how do we assure that every student on campus has a team of teachers and educators and uh, classified uh, educators who they feel connected to. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan. More to come. Item 14, MUSD strategic goals. Uh, strategic goal number one, which was spoken to in, in part of this discussion and the students advocating for themselves, build a culture of we that engages parents, staff, and community partners in supporting student success. This conversation that we just witnessed is a part of that. Uh, while we may not always agree or disagree, we may not always agree and sometimes disagree and not understand all the details behind it. Coming together to speak about these things so that we can move this community forward together is what the culture of we is about. Strategic goal number two, improve communication systems for better outreach to parents, students, and staff. Strategic goal number three, develop educational pathways that allow students to apply their passion in learning for their future careers. Strategic goal number four, focus services and support systems to ensure that all students are engaged in their learning and are making social, emotional, and academic gains. And that was on display tonight again. And thank you. And strategic goal number five, identify creative student-focused strategies to accommodate enrollment growth and ensure healthy learning environments. Agenda item number 15, superintendent's report, uh, 15I recognitions. Thank you, President Norwood. I would first like to start with an alumni of Melpitas Unified School District who has uh, started with our district after graduating. She uh, came back as an assistant in the classroom and left for a short time to go to the County Office of Education where she became a paraprofessional there and then came back to us as a teacher doing special services uh, for students who needed it, and then worked in our district office as a program manager supporting teachers um, who provide special services for learners, and is currently an assistant principal at Senate Elementary School. And in the next uh, several weeks, a couple months, will become full-time our new uh, coordinator of early childhood education and family engagement, supporting our child development centers and also family engagement throughout the district. And that is Ms. Vanessa Spedia. Good evening, board. 
Good evening, Executive Cabinet, Milpitas community. Today is quite a day. Um, listening to everybody speak here. Um, my mother is here, so she went to Milpitas schools. My grandparents moved here in the 50s. They're still here. They still own the family homes. Um, I'm born and raised in Milpitas, with Milpitas High School, played sports, Rancho, Rose, and today is a big day for me. I'm humbled and honored to be able to continue to serve my community, to live in my community, um, to walk my dogs every day at Milpitas High School and see the girls' soccer team out there practicing, um, to walk to Pomeroy every day. Um, I am Milpitas through and through, and I am so excited to be the next coordinator of early childhood development, to move forward our youngest learners. Um, to be able to work on family engagement in our district. I have quite a large family, quite a characters of families, and I know that it takes a lot and a lot of innovation and creativity to do so, and that's something I'm really excited about. And I'm just so thankful to my Senate family. Um, I'm going to miss them deeply, but I'm so excited for the next journey, and I thank you all for giving me this opportunity to serve continuously in Milpitas. So thank you. I appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Espedia. Um, yes, we'd like to do a picture with you with the board and bring mom up. Anybody else you would like to have with us? We have a number of other recognitions for tonight, and I would first uh, just like the board and public to know that we have four schools who were designated as California Distinguished Schools, and we'll have them at our next board meeting to recognize them. It's Pomeroy, Senate, Kirtner, and Matos. Thank you. And um, Scott, would you mind making sure that the message that we sent out on the on our inner group goes out to our employees by email? Thank you. All right. I would also like to recognize, and I got to go to the final match. It was super exciting to see Rancho versus Russell uh, girls basketball team. And it was literally down to the last few minutes it was back and forth, and the Russell Middle School girls prevailed, but as one of the uh, administrators pointed out, Superintendent Jordan, no matter who wins, you win. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so I'd like to say thank you to both of our coaches, uh, Frank Castro, who coaches uh, Rancho, and um, I'm sorry, I just went blank. And, Thank you, Tony Suarez, who coaches our Russell Middle School team. And I'd like to invite Coach Suarez and our Russell team up for a picture. Wait, let me get to, let me get to, let me get to coach, let me get to coach. 
for us. Let me squish in between you. Just a second. Thank you. Where's Coach? Thank you to the board and uh, first and foremost, uh, thank you to the parents and the players for being the best that they can be, uh, whether they're not feeling it that night, but we felt it that championship night. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Hope to see you guys again. You will. <laughs> thank you, Coach Suarez. And uh, thank you for correcting me. Uh, it is not Coach Castro, it is Coach Burns, Jim Burns, who coached our girls' Rancho basketball team. And speaking of Rancho, I would like to recognize the Rancho team for their sixth designation as a school to watch. So, if you'd come up, please. Yeah, I'd just like to uh, again congratulate our staff. It's incredible working at Rancho and being able to go through this process. It's once every three years that we take a look at our work, our data, our students, and um, really kind of do an introspection on how we're doing and how we can improve. And so I'd just like to say thank you for all the staff who engaged in this process, helped with writing the application, with putting uh, together a team to meet with the um, visiting uh, schools to watch person and just being uh, willing to go through this every three years. It's not easy, it's a lot of work, a lot of extra hours beyond the school day. And so um, I'm uh, happy that our staff has been willing to uh, continue this incredible program over the last uh, 18 years. Thank you. Thank you, Principal Mike Murray. Next, I'd like to recognize our band director, Mr. Moises Fagundes, and also our music boosters who support the band and congratulate them on their second time uh, for the championship of the Western Band Association. Can we have all of our musicians as well? I'd like to thank the board and everyone who supports the music program. Uh, this um, season we moved up a division. Our numbers were uh, higher, which is a good thing, but uh, more competition. Uh, so it was uh, an interesting season, but it was still good nonetheless. Thank you. Uh, I think, well, competitively for the marching band to continue the competitiveness, um, but also to keep the students involved um, within the music program in school and also after school too, and hopefully branch off into other modes of playing music or being involved in music. Thank you very much. Our next uh, 
recognitions are all virtual. And um, I think on this one, after I introduce them, I'll ask uh, President Norwood to say a few words about to say a few words about what it means to invest your time, and also the the sacrifice that those who lead in various elected roles make in order to serve the uh, constituents that they represent. And uh, first though, I would like to recognize our state assembly member, Alex Lee, our state senator, Aisha Wahab, and our Santa Clara County Board of Ed, trustee, Raina Lari. They are all with us tonight. And also I'd like to recognize newly elected Sylvia Arenas for the Santa Clara County Board of Supervisors and Maimona Absalberta to the Santa Clara County Board of Ed. Next, uh, at our next board meeting, we will recognize our city council. They are having a special meeting tonight. So uh, first, before we hear from each one of our electeds who I just named, Senator, Assembly Member, and uh, County Board of Ed trustee, uh, President Norwood, would you like to say a few words, please? Sure. Um each uh, election cycle, we are always honored to recognize the regionally elected officials that um, have been a part of the community uh, in one way or another, or have chosen uh, to take the step up and to be a representative of this region in terms of supporting the adults, uh, the businesses, the local economy, the safety, and the students. Um, the Milpitas Unified School District uh, recognizes the importance of these roles and the importance of our having a relationship with each one of you in more than one way, which includes the opportunity for you to come to our district, to speak to our students, uh, to reach out to our leadership, to ask questions about education in Milpitas and the surrounding areas, and continually finding ways to inspire not only our parents, um, our community, but our students to pursue avenues of uh, advocacy, community leadership, entrepreneurship, and most importantly, being participants in the democracy that we have in the United States. So we thank you very much all for being here, and we look forward to hearing a few words from each of you to our residents that are tuning in live, uh, as well as our students and our teachers and administrative staff that's participating today. So thank you again. Let's start with Assembly Member Alex Lee. Good evening, Milpitas School Board and everyone back home. Uh, I'm very grateful to yet again serve our second term uh, of my hometown, my home district. Of course, I'm a proud product of our Milpitas Public Schools. And in fact, supposedly I'm coming up to my 10 year reunion of MHS. So uh, this year, so I don't know who's planning it, but it might be me at this point. So we're figuring that out, but I'm very uh, happy to representing all of us. I uh, currently serve of you know, currently serve on several committees, but especially on the budget subcommittee for education finance and also the education um, policy committee. Uh, today, the governor unveiled the budget in which we are facing a possible deficit, but I have uh, want to just say that there's no cause for alarm at this time. One as a reminder is it is always a snapshot based especially on the stock market as of today. Uh, this time, two years ago, when I was still on the budget committee in 21 and 22, uh, we are always doom and gloom, and then yet we ended up with surpluses, so history could again repeat itself. And the second part is that even with the deficit this size, we have a sizable rainy day fund in which the core programming of investments should not be threatened. It's just really the expansion and growth. We're going to plateau a bit. So there's no cause for alarm right now. We have built and prepared for this day, and even locally, our leaders have built and prepared for this day so that we do not have to go back to uh, more than a decade ago, how painful those cuts were back in the 2008 recession. So we're doing all we can up here in Sacramento to make sure that our Milpitas families are getting the quality education they deserve and ought to have. And I continue to look forward to working all together to make Milpitas uh, the great city that we all know it is. So thank you so much. Thank you, Assembly Member Lee. And next, I'd like to invite our Santa Clara County Board of Ed trustee, Raina Lari. 
Good evening, everyone. I would like to thank uh, Superintendent uh, Cheryl Jordan and the Mill Peters United School District Board of Education for the invitation to be here today. Um, I'm deeply honored and really happy to have the opportunity to be here virtually today and able to listen and to learn. I'm looking forward to learning even more about the work you're doing for our children, our families, and our community. And um, in particular, your excellent work on health and wellness and also on inclusion. Uh, your website states that there are 52 languages uh, that are spoken in this diverse district. Um, I would like to learn more about how I can serve you and our students best and support your work um, effectively. Thank you again for the opportunity to be here today. Thank you, board member. And now I'd like to invite a representative of Senator Aisha Wahab. Hello, thank you so much. Uh, my name is Nergis Gizada. I am the district director for Senator Wahab. Uh, we just wanted to express our gratitude to the Milpitas School Board for this invitation. Um, this is our, we are newly elected and we are very excited to have Milpitas in our district and to be able to work with the community members of Milpitas. I know that education, health, are key priorities for our office, and we definitely look forward to working with the members of Milpitas, the school board, um, in making sure that everybody is taken care of and that we're passing policies that impact us in a positive way. So thank you very much for having us here. Thank you to each of you again for spending time with us tonight, and especially for the commitment that you've made to serve uh, the people uh, in our community, as well as in the state of California. And we extend an invitation for you to come anytime and visit our schools. And that concludes my recognitions and brings me to my superintendent's report. Uh, the board and community, students, parents, and especially our MUSD team members. Recall that this time last year was uh, the almost the apex of the COVID surge. And our staff members were doing everything possible just to support the learning going on in the classrooms in spite of being short staffed due to so many illnesses. And also having to test, I don't know, upwards of 100 students per school each day and in some cases more. And with that in mind, uh, we, the staff, we planned ahead and with HR, we assured that we had some substitutes on hand to fill vacancies our uh, cabinet and district office uh, dispersed to school sites in the morning to check on things. And our safety first team did a lot of discussion and uh, advertising and the principals picked that up around making sure that people use those tests and it paid off. So you see that as of today in Santa Clara County, the uh, wastewater monitoring system still shows that COVID is high. However, in our uh, situation with Milpitas Unified, we had uh, we have 652 students since the beginning of the year who have reported COVID, and that is uh, 125 since the last reporting, which was December 13th. And these reports also include students who haven't been at school, but uh, submitted reports from home. And with staff, we were at 88, and now we're at 135. And we distributed another 7,000 uh, test kits since coming back. So testing worked. On the first day, we had 46 students and 22 staff members who reported that they had done their test and discovered that they had COVID and they stayed home, which meant 
they weren't at school or at work in offices uh, spreading COVID unknowingly. So the testing strategy worked. In comparison, um, for this time last year, you see that the average number of staff members, and this includes all of our staff members, those in the classroom, as well as those who are in the offices and on the grounds. We had an average of 43.3 the first week of school who were absent. The same time period last year, there were 82.2. And then as far as students go, for the first week of school, we had an average of 742 students absent. And for the same period last year, uh, over 1,200 students absent. So the testing and being mindful and careful if you feel symptoms, testing, and uh, if you test negative, that you are wearing your mask and keeping your distance. And it's really as on safety first, uh, Scott's motto at the end is always, uh, we're safe together, and Scott? We are MUSD family, and uh, we continue to move forward together. That's right. And so because everybody is being mindful and using those tests and staying home, we are moving forward together. And I want to thank the HR team for assuring that we were able to secure substitutes uh, hired unassigned so that we were able to put them into those spots where uh, we had we were not able to have a substitute. I remember on the first day we had a uh, secretary out and nobody to cover. We had several paraprofessionals out and nobody to cover. And I think it was two teachers out and nobody to cover. But we were able to cover them because we had planned ahead. And today I uh, directed our HR director, uh, Damon James, to maintain the 10 substitutes throughout the end of the year because as I was going around the first week of school and asking the different principals how things went, I heard uh, three times that it was so nice to not have to worry about how they were going to fill a sub vacancy because there wasn't a sub and they didn't have anybody to fill the class. So it's... Uh, pays off and great dividends for us to be able to have somebody to fill in those vacancies. So for the remainder of the year, we will have a uh, substitute unassigned for um, at least our 10 elementary schools. And that concludes my report. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan. And thank you for the updates in terms of comparing um, where we are last year um, in terms of the first uh, week, a couple of weeks back to school and today and all the um, strategies that were put in place to ensure that we were able to uh, maintain our learning continuity um, moving forward. And we look forward to the next board, um, the superintendent update with additional information and doing some, a comparison to where we were last year so that we have a good gauge in terms of we need to prepare in any other different direction. Are there any other comments from the board regarding the superintendent's report at this time? Okay. Um, let's continue on with the superintendent's executive cabinet report. Members of the executive cabinet will, will have recent significant information to present to the governing board on topics that are not on the agenda. Reports are limited to 90 seconds each with five minutes allocated for the principal's report. And we have no principal's report tonight as uh, we were are literally coming off of our vacation. So I would like to turn to our HR assistant soup, Jonathan Brunson, to start us off with the executive cabinet reports. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan, trustees. Um, I guess we get to use that time because there's no school uh, reporting tonight, right? No, just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> um, first of all, uh, Happy New Year, everybody. Happy, safe New Year. Happy times with your family and friends. And, and together, uh, like you've heard, uh, we will uh, continue to stay strong. HR uh, cares deeply about our employees. And with that, um, we've reached the midpoint of our school year. And we're asking our certificated staff what their intent is for next year. And um, just another reminder for them that our contract, if you notify us that you're going to retire and you've been with the district, 
uh, before the year 2007, you can continue uh, your district allocated uh, amounts for uh, health benefits. And we've received a few, not too many, thank goodness, because we need our teachers to stay here. Um, but we're excited that it helps us with our planning and for recruitment too. Uh, we're also having our site admin update their staffing list and their student list so that we can start uh, beginning to make projections on our accounts. And this is what drives our recruitment. And, uh, and why we do such a good job in this is because we start so early in the process. And uh, we just received word, a shout out to uh, Mr. James and Preeti for her support and, and Wendy as well in business services. Uh, that we received uh, uh, the funding for uh, San Jose State and their student teacher residency program. And that means that we will have additional funds to support our teachers, supporting uh, student teachers in our classrooms in the areas of elementary education, uh, bilingual education, and special education. And so we're really excited about that. And uh, we are in a, uh, uh, a cohort with Oak Grove Elementary, Campbell, Sunnyvale, and Milpitas. But Milpitas has taken the lead when it comes to uh, putting the program together and support. And again, Damon uh, James, our director for HR, has put a lot of time and energy in this. And this is going to uh, bear big fruit for us in the future because um, these teachers are at our sites as we speak, but they're getting additional support and time, as well as their mentor teachers, to uh, develop their craft. And with that, I'll end my report. Happy New Year. Thank you. And our executive directors of learning development, Preeti Jahari and Mary Jude Dorpinghaus. Good evening. Uh, I will begin this evening and a very happy new year to everyone as well. Um, as Superintendent Jordan uh, mentioned earlier, on Friday, State Superintendent of Public Instruction Tony Thurman announced that 356 elementary schools had been selected for the prestigious 2023 California Distinguished Schools Program. Um, I thought that I would share a little bit more about this, um, and I know that, Scott, you will share more later. But this award program is celebrating its return this year after COVID-19 pandemic temporarily suspended it, reporting of state and local uh, student data. To be selected is a big deal. As a California Distinguished School, the CDE, or the California Department of Education, uses multiple measures to identify those eligible schools based on their performance on state indicators that we find on our California school dashboard. Uh, specifically, schools were selected based on analyzing data through the 2022 dashboard, including assessment results, chronic absenteeism, suspension rates, socioeconomic data. And so, four, as mentioned earlier, four of our MUSD schools were among the 356 throughout the entire state. So, big, again, a big shout out and congratulations to Kurtner, Matos, Pomeroy, and Senate Elementary Schools. And I'll turn it over to um, Preeti Jahari. <laughs> Sorry. She knows me. Um, so one more highlight to share uh, on behalf of our district is that MUSD was one of 75 districts awarded the Competitive State Anti-Bias Education Grant. And we received the full amount requested, which was 200000 and the maximum you could ask for. The purpose of the Anti-Bias Education Grant is to prevent, address, and eliminate racism and bias in all California public schools, um, and therefore making public schools inclusive and supportive of all students. Funds were available to e um, each applicant that were, the way that they evaluated us was on the content and the quality of our application and proposed activities. Through the grant, um, we specifically here in Milpitas are looking to deepen our own learning and broaden our footprint and impact um, through the work that the learning and development team does, the curriculum policy committee does, and the culture of we equity team. The funds are primarily primarily requested for ongoing professional de development as well as stipends for committee work that includes um, teachers and leaders from across the district. Uh, switching gears a little bit, um, both Superintendent Jordan and um, Executive Director Dorpinghaus alluded to the California Dashboard, um, which was published in December. At the very start of the December winter break, the Santa Clara County Office of Education also made announcements about differentiated assistance. This is tied to the state accountability plan um, that's directly aligned to the dashboard. 
Uh, SCOE it will be hosting a meeting to support us through this differentiated assistance. Um, and as always, when we reach out to our MUSD leaders for a call for help, they jump right in and say, what can we do? So we have assembled a very dynamic team of leaders for our first of four meetings with the county office. Team members include um, myself and Mary Jude Dorpinghouse, uh, Raquel Kosanoki, Michelle Shearer, Jillian Valdez, Derek Castaneda, Hethel Patel, Tell, um, Emily, Elf, uh, Emily D. Laura Elfson, Amanda Gross, Diana Orlando, and Gina Satan. Thank you to all of these members for stepping up. This is a, a large time commitment on their end. Um, and as you can see, uh, the team includes teachers, MTA leadership, uh, leaders from the different grade bands, as well as the LND team. Thank you. Okay, I guess I'm just gonna continue. Yes, Assistant <laughs> Superintendent Wendy Zhang of Business Services. Good evening, everyone. I'm sure some of you probably already uh, heard today, Governor Newsom released his uh, state budget proposal for the 2023-24 fiscal year. The initial analysis from School Services of California shows that the state revenue projection is not as aggressive as compared to the projections in the current state budget act. However, the governor is planning to fund an estimate cost of living adjustment COLA of 8.13% in this proposal. Staff will attend a budget workshop next week uh, the information received from that workshop will help us to start planning for our district's 23-24 budget adoption. Tomorrow at 6 p.m., we will meet in person at the Innovation Campus for our Bond Oversight Committee meeting. At this meeting, we will provide a construction and a budget updates on our bu uh, bond uh, projects, and you are all welcome to attend. That concludes my report for tonight. Thank you, team. Thank you, um, Executive Cabinet. Um, Superintendent, I'd like to um, make a request for, let's look at the, the, um, the reports that are, says the reports are limited to 90 seconds each. Um, there's so much good stuff that they have to share. I'm not sure if um, 90 seconds is long enough. Um, so I, I'd like to revisit um, that um, part of what we're doing or to determine if there's specific things that they could speak to so that we may be able to stay within the time allocation. I like hearing all the different things and I'm sure the board and the community does as well. But so as we state here, reports are limited to 90 seconds each and we never kind of stick to that. It's okay. We just want to make sure that we figure out what we're able to provide um, that, that provides the proper um, knowledge, not only to the board, but to the, um, the community as well as they listen in on, on our meeting. Board group agreements will go down the line, um, starting with um, 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 Vice President Min No. Sure, uh, for board, by law, uh, 9001, we adopted on December 13, 2022. Board members and the superintendent agreed to keep learning and achievement for all students as the primary focus. Ask, ask questions for our own understanding. Be open and honest with each other. No surprises, including unapproved communication with law enforcement, news media, regional elected officials on behalf of the district and or board. Uh, be aware that our behavior in the community reflects as us on, a, on us as a team. Communicate proactively with each other about topics, questions, and challenges in open session and in advance of public board meetings in compliance with the Brown Act. Participate in professional development and commit the time and energy necessary to be an informed and effective leader. Actively support the culture of we in action, deed, and opportunity to serve the students and parents of the Milpitas Unified School District. Agenda item 18, board communication request. This part of the agenda provides school board members the opportunity to report on their activities as elected representatives. School board members may request the placement of items in future board agendas, relay information from the community, or request information from staff. 
The student board representative reports on school and student activities. Reports are limited to 90 seconds each. And let's start with our student board rep. Uh, sure, go right ahead, uh, board, uh, student board rep Bakta. Hi, school board and various community members present here today. To close our last semester, our leadership organization hosted a winter bash in association with the SJCC Milpitas Extension staff. As well as we just wrapped up our tutoring program in the first week of the new semester, we will review the program as a whole, but many of our tutors observed a general improvement of student progress and grades. On the first day of the new semester, our campus hosted a dual enrollment orientation to 150 students. As well as, today we had an industry we had industry presenters from Oracle, Mr. Gonzalez and Mr. Bao from the Milpitas Commerce of Technology as well, came to present to both our classes about their, path, their career pathways and learning about what their jobs entailed. Next week, we have Mr. Barry Posner from Santa Clara University to host a leadership academy with our students. And towards the end of the month, we are going on a UC Berkeley trip for our juniors to consider whether they would like to apply and attend, and for our seniors who are looking to transfer to the school from community college. This month, our juniors will be taking SWAC tests in order, to, in order to prepare for the actual test in April. Thank you. Thank you, and next we have a student board rep, Sharma. Uh, good evening, everyone. Um, LSG is currently planning for some of our biggest events yet. Currently, we are beginning to prepare for Trojan Olympics, which is arguably our largest school-wide event, featuring class competitions, noon times, decorations, and more. Additionally, our student store has officially launched, and students and staff can purchase merchandise and snacks a couple of times throughout the week at multiple locations around campus. Next, we are preparing for the general elections to determine the next LSG cohort for the next school year. Uh, we are brainstorming the most effective ways to publicize and increase school engagement through teaser videos, interactive publicity, and a streamlined application. We hope to involve at least 51% of students in this entire process, whether it be applying, campaigning, and voting. Additionally, we have two other events coming up at the end of January, and they are Clog Rush and Multicultural Week. Clog Rush will be held from January 23rd to the 27th, and students can visit club booths and explore new clubs and decide which ones they would like to join for the rest of the semester. Lastly, Multicultural Week will be from January 30th to February 3rd, and during this week, we will hold a bunch of events that will help students showcase and share their cultures. Thank you. And that's it from our student board reps. Thank you very much, uh, Scott. Board member Naka. Good evening and Happy New Year, everyone. I did attend the swearing-in ceremony of uh, Assembly Member Alex Lee. Also attended the double tenth celebration, which is the flag raising ceremony at Chinese Cultural uh, Center. Also volunteered with the Family Giving Tree. Milbita, attended the Milpitas Chamber of Commerce board meeting, and the, also the topping of ceremony of the Innovation Campus. And also did attend the Expression Speech Club at Senate Elementary. Thank you very much. That concludes my report. Wow, you're hitting the ground running, I see. That's awesome. Thank you for sharing. Uh, Board Clerk Yip Tuan. Thank you and Happy New Year, everyone. Um, as for me, I attended, uh, um, I went on a tour of Metro Ed with Superintendent Alyssa Lynch, uh, also a volunteer at the Family Giving Tree. I also attended the uh, double tenth celebration of the Republic of China flag raising event. Um, we also had the chamber board meeting, also attended the swear-in of assembly member Alex Lee, and also the uh, topping of the innovation campus. That's it. Thank you, as always, for your commitment to community. Um, board Clerk Yip Chuan. Uh, Vice President Min Nguyen. Yes, thank you, President Norwood. Happy New Year's, everyone. Um, similar to the same events, our, my fellow board members attended. I also attended the Rose PTO meeting. Uh, also attended our former school board member, Han Lien's um, swearing in someone for city council. Um, and uh, that concludes my report. Thank you, Vice President. We know for your service to the Mount Unified School District. Um, I would like to use my board communication quest for time to request some items be placed on items for future board agenda. Um, the first is the um, um, hosting an MUSD student leadership um, summit or conference 
where we get to meet with the presidents of the school sites as well as the presidents at the secondary as well so that uh, we can talk about how um, our students can have the ability to lead in governance and partnership uh, with the school board, which will also be a um, almost a um, Develop, develop, developmental pathway primer for our future board members. So we want to be able to do an MUSD student lead, leadership summit with uh, the school board. Um, the other thing is um, a fentanyl update in terms of what we are continuing to do in our district to make our parents aware and students aware of the dangers. Um, I believe the statistics said there were some statistics about the the negative impacts on students in the state of California and the country. So um, it's not gonna go away. We wanna make sure that we are top of mind so that we can avoid that potentially ever happening in the Milpitas Unified School District. Um, there's still conversations to be had about our district uh, campus uh, safety in terms of being able to protect our school sites from uh, areas that um, aren't easily uh, protected by um, our schools or our police departments that support our school districts. Um, and those are the items that I would like to see placed on uh, future board agendas or for discussion at some point. Okay. Um, item 19, action item 19I, business services. Uh, 19IA, approved Eichler and Associates for Cal Shape Equipment Repairs and Pelican Installation at Milpitas High School and Innovation Campus Assistant Superintendent Business Services. Yes, good evening again. And if you recall, uh, the board previously approved the agreement with Eckler to be in our consultant to help the district to apply for the CalShip grant. And I'm very happy to announce that the state awarded us about 1.9 million. And we will receive the first 50% of a payment soon. And then tonight, we're asking the board to approve the two um, append, uh, Appendix B for the previously approved the two agreements. One Appendix B for the Innovation Campus. And then the cost of the Innovation Campus, basically, um, uh, Eckler will uh, finish the, the report and uh, the fund, uh, it will be funded through the CalShip grant, so the 20,000 cost. And then for the high school building L, uh, that was not included in the original proposal. And uh, now with the work done and the more assessment has been performed at the high school building L. And now we would like to add that into the agreement under high school. And that cost is the, the total is about 81,000. But out of the 81,000, 52,000 can be reimbursed through the grant. And that means the district will be out of pocket about 29,000 for repairs. And tonight I also have uh, Rosemary from Eckler here virtually online with us. And I would like to, have, um, to invite uh, Rosemary maybe to provide an update on the CalShip grant, like where we are in regards of the process and also maybe the timeline. Uh, Rosemary? Um, yes, hi. Uh, uh, Scott, could you do us a favor and make sure that the agenda is up on the screen while, um, do we usually have the agenda on the screen? Okay, thank you. Okay, so can we have a Rosemary online? Yes, I'm here. Good evening. Hi, Rosemary. Thank you for staying with us. Uh, do you mind maybe to give us a quick update on, uh, in regards to the process, like where we are and what is the overall timeline for this? Yes, well, right? thank you for your comments in the intro. Um, I think everyone is familiar with the CalShape program is for the indoor air quality. Um, it provides funding for surveying the HVAC equipment on each campus, um, we were granted from the board 22 survey days. Um, so far, we have used 11 out of those 22 and have surveyed all of the Calaveras Hills campus as well as the Milpitas High School campus. Based on that survey, we um, established um, what equipment was not functioning properly and provided 
not only repairs to that equipment, but installing the new Pelican controls, which have the CO2 sensors, which are required for the program. Uh, over, we have completely installed all equipment and done repairs for the Calaveras Hills site. And we have installed 60% of the equipment and the repairs needed at the uh, Milpitas High School site as of this last break, we were able to get in there and uh, it was great to be able to get that much done at once. We, you know, um, hit the ground running and the team at Service Unlimited did a fantastic job. Uh, building L is about 20% of the equipment and uh, controls at Milpitas High School. So once we do the building L, we'll do some cleanup on the portables that are out there and other facilities such as gyms and things like that, that will complete the high school as far as the equipment installation. That's the second phase of the process. The third phase is what we call the commissioning side of it. And that's where we go back in and based on the newly installed equipment, we have to do airflow measurements and calibration to make sure we're providing the correct amount of ventilation. And also we have to report this information back to the California Energy Commission to complete the, the program. So in completing the program, when we are done with each site, we will get the other almost a million dollars of the grant. Um, you should be receiving a check for the first 50% um, of the grant within they said about a week ago, two to four weeks. So hopefully it's about a week to three weeks out, you will receive that funding. So at the beginning of this process, we decide to kind of do it in bits and pieces. And I know that is a little more, um, you know, it, it's a little more paperwork as far as the board approvals and things like that. But that way you are actually seeing really in real time how we're progressing with this. It is a quite, quite a large project because not only are we just doing the improvements of the indoor air quality, but putting in complete new HVAC controls for the campus and providing what we call demand control ventilation, which is an energy saving feature. So uh, doing all this is, it's quite a bit, it's quite an undertaking, but we feel like we're progressing very quickly with the process. The next steps would be to take those additional survey uh, days that we have and look at the middle school. So those, uh, the two middle schools, Rancho and Russell will be next in line for surveys. At that time, we will determine exactly how much equipment, what repairs are needed, and then we will change over the controls at that time. And then again, come in and commission that work. So uh, once we have the high schools done, will progress with the middle schools and then the elementary schools. Uh, timeline for this, it really is dependent on access. Um, we, again, we don't have complete access to get into classrooms to do airflow measurements. So we're doing this as we have more opportunities to actually you know, have access to the classrooms when no students are in session. So um, that being said, we're hoping that uh, of course, over the breaks, uh, both the winter break, spring break, and of course, once uh, the campus is out for the summer break, that's really where we want to hit these other sites. Um, pretty, you know, pretty, uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We want to hit it pretty hard over that time. And hopefully, um, we can get through most of the elementary schools by the end of the summer, um, by the summer break. However, we do have a two year window to complete this work. So we wanna make sure we're doing it effectively, efficiently, but also we do have that window to do it um, and provide the final reporting to get the funding. So that's kind of where we're at with it. Um, do, are there any questions from the board? There are no questions for the board at this time, from the board at this time. Okay. Is there a motion? Move to approve. We have a motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any, or is there any additional discussion? Um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Wendy, for um, Milpitas High Building L, because during the summer, I believe, 
when it was extremely hot and we had to we tried to bring in air conditioning and all or fans and all those type of portable air conditioners to try to address uh the need which we we did our best but it wasn't you know up to the standard that we would like so the fact that you've been able to uh, identify this to move forward only as quickly as possible and rosemary is talking about how to move that forward quickly um i definitely really we all really appreciate that moving forward so that our kids and our teachers have the uh, most safe uh learning environments and with that motion and second and that being a part of the discussion um all in favor aye aye, aye. any opposed any abstain? Motion carries. Okay. Great. Thank you very much. We look forward to working on building L next. We know that's been problematic. Thank you. Have a wonderful evening. Okay, you too. Bye now. Thank you. And also, and uh, President Norwood and uh, our maintenance um, operation department MOT is the team and the drive behind this. Awesome. Thank you for sharing that. Um, item 19, um, I, 19-2-A, board vacancy. Uh, board member Han Lian has submitted her resignation to the board and superintendent effective December 20th, 22nd. The procedures for filling this vacancy are outlined in board policy 9223. Thank you, President Norwood. So, uh, According to our board bylaw, when we have a vacancy on the board, we, it's according to our board bylaw as well as to, um, to law, the board has 60 days from the date, effective date of a board member's resignation. And in Trustee Lien's uh, case, her resignation letter states that Jan uh, December 20th was her effective, effective date. So we have until mid-February to identify a person that the board would uh, like to appoint to fill that vacancy for the remainder of the term. And it is a two-year term that is left, so it would go through November 2024. And so what we need to do and what we're prepared to do is uh, if the board directs us to move towards the process to fill the vacancy by appointment, then Scott uh, Forstner, our communications specialist and board support specialist, will post in our local media online as well as we will post at our uh, school sites and in local coffee shops and tea shops a notice that there is a vacancy on the board with information on how to complete an application. And we would propose that the board would hold its special board meeting in order to hear all of the candidates, discuss what they hear from the candidates, and identify the candidate that the board, uh, through a normal uh, voting process with uh, Robert's rules of order, would then identify the candidate who will become the board appointee. And so that would be fe February 7th at 5.30 p.m. And then we would have uh, the candidate's applications due to the superintendent's office by the last Friday of January, which would then provide the board subcommittee, which is to be made up of two board members, go through all of the paper applications and select those that are um, qualified. So we need uh, two actions. One is for the board to um, take action on putting the process forward for board appointment. And two is for the board to determine who the two board members will be for that subcommittee to review the paper applications and identify those that are qualified to come on February 7th for uh, the board's interview of all candidates. If the board would choose not to do the appointment by, to fill the vacancy by appointment, then the other option is that the board, excuse me, that the County Office of Education Superintendent would then uh, call for a special election. And we know that the special election from past experience, depending on if there are any other 
uh, ballot measures at that time could cost about $130,000 or more. Thank you, Superintendent Jordan, uh, for that um, update in terms of the process of fulfilling uh, the board vacancy. So I believe there was two parts there. Um, one part was for us to um, first approve the fact that we are going to appoint. Mm -hmm. And after we agree to appoint, we create a subcommittee to um, review the applications and select the top five and then prepare that, uh, um, review that between Feb uh, the end of the month prior shortly thereafter, giving the candidates that are selected enough time to um, get their schedules correct to meet for the February 7th, 2023 board meeting, where they would go through a panel of board members and then we would select uh, the appointee. That's correct. Okay. I mean, is there a motion? This I move to motion. We have a motion. Is there a second? Second. Um, we we need that because this is uh, technical. We need the full motion, which would be listed on the item where it says recommendation. Chamber can scroll. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, is there a motion to select a sub? No. Um, is there a motion to so select a subcommittee of two board members to review applications and direct staff to post the board vacancy and set special board meeting on February 7, 2023 at 5.30 p.m. to conduct interviews? I move to motion. We have the motion. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second. Is there any additional discussion? Are we determine the, the two board members to review the application as Correct. part of our discussion? So um, I would like to nominate myself as one of the committee members. Okay. Um, we have uh, Min No, who um, has expressed interest in being one of the committee members. Uh, do we have any other board members that are are interested in being a part of that committee or are there any other nominations to be a part or any other nominations of board members to be on that committee? Yes, I nominate myself as well. Okay, we have two nominations of being on the committee. Uh, Anu and you, there's only the two of us left. Um, are you okay with uh, Kelly and Min? Sure. Okay, and I am uh, okay with them as well. So we have, um, uh, a motion, we have a second, we have the discussion. The discussion identifies uh, Vice President Minno and Board Clerk Kelly Upchuan to be the designees for the, uh, sub, for the committee, for the subcommittee to review the applications uh, that we will receive by the end of the month. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any abstain? Motion carries. All right. Thank you. We will get to work on that right away. It's got, we're, this is the first of the year. We're a little bit rusty. I need you to kind of help me out a little bit on the checking on the public comments from the public. I've missed it a couple times, so we want to make sure that we get that back in place. Uh, we can get back to that same rhythm. For sure, I'll, I'll get that in, the, in your notes there. And then if there was a hand raised, we'd let you know for sure. Awesome. Thank you very much. Uh, item uh, from Superintendent's item, item B, adopt resolution 2023-24, recognizing and honoring January 16th, 2023 as Martin Luther King Jr. Day. Um, yeah, uh, so we put together a, 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 video, a special video reading for this resolution. It was uh, conducted by the Milpitas High School Boys Varsity Basketball Team, and uh, we're going to show it to you right now. I'm Xavier Minster. I'm a small forward here at Milpitas, uh, a sophomore. Resolution 2023 to 24, recognizing and honoring January 16, 2023 as Martin Luther King Jr. Day. 
Whereas Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. was born on January 15, 1929, and whereas in February of 1948, Dr. King was ordained in Christian ministry at the age of 19 at Ebenezer Baptist Church in Atlanta, Georgia, and became assistant pastor of Ebenezer Baptist Church. And whereas Dr. King, who attended segregated public schools in Georgia before earning a Bachelor of Arts degree from Morehouse College, a Bachelor of Divinity degree from Crozer Tech Theological Seminary in Pennsylvania, and a Doctrine of Philosophy degree in Theology from Boston University, rose to prominence as a civil rights activist, committed to peace, justice, equality. Hi, I'm Lamont Davis, uh, sophomore guard from PSI. The work of Dr. King created a basis of understanding and respect and help communities in the United States as a whole to act cooperatively and courageously to resort tolerance, justice, and equality between people. And whereas Dr. King dedicated his life to securing the fundamental principles of the United States, liberty and justice for all United States citizens. And Dr. King was the leading civil rights advocate of his time, spearheading the civil rights movement in the United States during the 1950s and the 1960s, and earning worldwide recognition as an eloquent and articulate spokesperson for equality. Uh, my name is Landon Nguyen. I'm a senior shooting guard for Peter's High School basketball team. Whereas through his work in reliance on nonviolent protests, Dr. King was instrumental in the passage of the Civil Rights Act of 1964 and the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And whereas Dr. King led the Montgomery, Alabama bus boycott for 381 days to protest the arrest of Rosa Parks and the segregation of the bus system in Montgomery, and on December 21st, 1956, the Supreme Court declared laws requiring segregation on buses unconstitutional. And whereas between 1957 and 1968, Dr. King traveled more than 6 million miles, spoke more than 2,500 times, and wrote five books and numerous articles supporting efforts around the country to end injustice and bring about social change and desegregation. Hi, I'm Jake Boldum, senior point guard for the Milpitas Trojans. And whereas on August 28, 1963, Dr. King led the march on Washington, D.C., the largest rally of the civil rights movement, during which, from the steps of the Lincoln Memorial and before a crowd of more than 200,000 people, Dr. King delivered his famous I Have a Dream speech, one of the classic orations in American history. And Whereas Dr. King was a champion of nonviolence, fervently advocated nonviolent resistance as Could we the pause for a moment to end segregation and race. There's something going on with the sound and it's difficult to hear. I would like to bring this back on January 24th when we have a chance to clean up the sound. Thank you. That was the uh, basketball practice. We were outside. Understand, but we got to make sure we can hear it. Thank you. So we're going to bring that back when? At our next board meeting. Thank you. Um, 20 consent items. Consent items are considered routine and will be acted upon by the board in one motion. There is no discussion on these items prior to the motion unless board unless members of the board, staff, or public request that specific items be tabled or removed for discussion or correction. Are there any items to be tabled, removed for discussion or correction? No. Is there a motion? Move to approve the consent items. We have a motion to approve the consent items. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a we have an, a motion and a second. Um, any additional discussion? Uh, seeing no additional discussion, any public comment? No public comment at this time. Thank you. With uh, no public comment at this time and no additional discussion, uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? Any sustained? None. Motion carries. Dates of future board meetings, uh, January 24th, tentative study session, 5 p.m., tentative closed session, 6 p.m., open session, 7 p.m., hybrid on Zoom, YouTube, and Randall Elementary World Languages School. Um, tentative February 7th, special meeting board appointment, open session, 5.30, hybrid on Zoom, YouTube, at, at YouTube and Randall Elementary World Languages School. 
And then uh, February 28th, tentative study session, 5 p.m. Study session, 5 p.m., tentative closed session, 6 p.m., open session, 7 p.m., hybrid on Zoom, YouTube, and Randall Elementary World Languages School. Any additional announcements or reminders from staff or the board? Yes, uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Jr. Day, and on Wednesday at Milpitas High School, we have the at the table with Martin Luther King. It's a assembly, first one was at 8.30, the second one was at 10.20, and we're working on a third one for elementary students. And if uh, board members would like to attend, it's a interactive assembly, and the outcome is that students not only hear and experience uh, the civil rights movement through uh, Martin Luther King's perspective, but that they make a commitment to make uh, some sort of change in their own um, in their own lives in relation to their community. So if you'd like to go, uh, please let me know. And also, I will share with the board and also with all staff an opportunity through the uh, Rolled House Project with Dr. Claiborne Carson, a live three-day film festival with um, various speakers and opportunities for discussion virtually. Thank you, and I do recall Dr. Claiborne Carson um, from Stanford University who um, authored uh, um, a number of books on the life of Dr. Martin Luther King, and he was actually here. He participated um, via, he, had, he, he came to one of our board meetings virtually uh, to talk about his work and support for uh, the culture of we, what we do in Mel Peters Unified mm -hmm. School District. For, thank you, Superintendent Jordan, for keeping that relationship uh, alive and well. Mm -hmm. um, there are no other uh, room. Okay. Yes, Kelly. Yeah, so there is a Lunar New Year celebration at City Hall this Saturday, um, January the 14th, that's 6 p.m. Um, and this year's uh, Lunar New Year is on uh, Sunday, January the 22nd. It's awesome. earlier this year. Thank you. Thank you for bringing that to our attention. You're welcome. Um, the city's having a, the city is doing. Mm -hmm. Okay. Awesome. Thank you for that. Nothing on the left. Nothing on the.